Dia minta saya berbincang dengan anak lelaki nombor tiga. Saya uh, tahu bahawa isteri, uh, isteri abang Ipar saya adalah seorang pekerja. Tetapi saya member, diberitahu bahawa saya ak, hanya akan melakukan kerja pembersihan kerana terdesak untuk mencari makanan untuk anak-anak. Saya bersetuju untuk bekerja sebagai tukang bersih. Mereka membawa saya ke sebuah hotel di Keluang dan saya membuat kerja pembersihan untuk seketikaan. Kemudian kami uh, berpindah ke Mentekap di mana kami tinggal sebuah hotel. Di sini semasa isteri Abang Ipar saya pergi ke kedai. Abang Ipar saya merugul saya dan meninggalkan saya di dalam satu bilik. Selepas itu Abang Ipar saya memaksakan saya untuk menjadi pekerja seks dan dan mem- memberitahu saya bahawa tiada jalan lain untuk saya mencari rezeki. Akhirnya saya tinggal di sana selama sebulan. Mereka tidak memberi kami gaji, mereka hanya memberi kami makanan, pakaian dan tempat tinggal. Akhirnya terdapat serbuan di rumah pelacur ter- tersebut dan saya berjaya meninggalkan tempat itu. Tetapi saya bah- bahawa keluarga saya akan menghalau saya dan tidak akan menerima saya kerana saya telah meninggalkan anak-anak saya di sana dan tidak pulang selama tiga bulan. Akhirnya malam itu saya menunggu di situ perhentian bas di Sentul. Lima lelaki mabuk berhenti di situ selepas meninggalkan kelab berhampiran mereka bersenjata dan membawa saya secara paksa dan menrogol saya di Hotel Korea di KL. Saya ber, berjaya melarikan diri dan uh, memberitahu satu teksi pemandu teksi tersebut membawa saya ke belai untuk membuat laporan tetapi saya takut dan tidak berani membuat laporan. Jadi saya pergi ke perhentian bas itu semula. Seorang lelaki lain mendekati saya. Saya berbincang kadar bayaran dengannya dan meminta makanan dan tempat tinggal. Apabila saya memberanikan diri untuk pulang ke rumah ibu saya dihalau keluar bersama anak-anak saya. Kerana tidak tiada jalan lagi untuk mencari tempat tinggal untuk diri saya dan anak-anak saya. Jadi saya menyambung ke, pe, menyambung kerja seks saya. Pernah pernah sekali saya ditangkap dan dibawa ke lokap jalan travel saya dipaksa untuk berbogil dan melakukan squat sambilan pegawai polis wanita mendera saya secara lisan dan memanggil saya dengan nama-nama yang menghina Kali lain pula Kami ditangkap dan dipaksa Untuk membersihkan balai polis Kami juga diugut Dengan pendedahan media Saya telah Saya telah menghadapi Begitu banyak pendedahan Sebagai pekerja seks Saya pernah dipukul dan digigit pada mulanya saya tidak mempunyai sebarang pengetahuan tentang penyakit kelamin atau HIV AIDS setelah beke- selepas bekerja dengan NGO saya um, mendapat sa- tahu tentangnya dan mempunyai lebih kesedaran ini adalah maklumat yang penting kerana sebenarnya saya mempunyai ramai pelanggan yang tidak menggunakan kondom kami selalunya memasukkan kapas di dalam faraj kami semasa kami ke, faraj kami uh, semasa kami datang head kerana perlu duit untuk tanggungjawab anak saya saya juga menghadapi banyak stigma daripada masyarakat doktor dan jururawat Apabila saya pergi untuk ujian HIV, saya takut berhadapan dengan doktor. Sebaik saya mereka mengetahui saya seorang pekerja seks, mereka cuba mengelakkan 
daripada saya dan hingga sehingga tidak dibenarkan saya membuka pintu di klinik saya terpaksa duduk jauh daripada orang lain salah seorang daripada mereka pernah mengata berkata kepada saya padan muka awak uh, padan muka awak kalau awak sikit ka, kalau awak sakit kerana anda membuat kerja seperti ini ini sangat menghina dan saya rasa kepulaukan pekerja seks juga berhak mendapatkan perlindungan akhirnya saya mula menjadi sukarelawan dengan yayasan PT dan bekerja dengan komuniti ada ada satu training di luar negara tentang hak asasi manusia saya um, saya mula berasa lebih di memperkasakan dan melibatkan diri secara aktif dalam kerja-kerja advokasi. Pada ketika itu, banyak NGO wanita dan NGO lain tidak mempunyai pemahaman yang baik tentang pengalaman pekerja seks. Kami sering dilayan dengan cara yang merendahkan kami atau kami merasa digunakan. Setelah saya mengetahui tentang hak saya, saya menjadi lebih berani tetapi ini bermakna saya menjadi satu ancaman kepada pihak berkuasa. Sehingga kini tiada seorang pun dalam keluarga saya yang mengetahui mengenai pekerjaan saya. Terdapat begitu banyak stigma mengenai kerja seks dan kita sering disuruh menukar pekerjaan kerana ia tidak diterima walau bagaimanapun pekerja seks tidak akan pernah berakhir jadi adalah lebih penting untuk men mensyah kriminalisasikan kerja seks supaya pekerja dilindungi selamat daripada keganasan dan diberi kesedaran ke dan akses kepada penjaga kesihatan jadi saya minta untuk di dikriminalisasikan uh, pekerja seks itu sahaja terima kasih Lata atas perkongsian testimoni tersebut uh, untuk pengetahuan semua Lata sebenarnya ada bersama kita secara langsung uh, tetapi beliau tidak akan membuka atau mempasang kameranya uh, dengan itu, saya ingin menjemput panel hakim sekiranya ada soalan untuk Lata. Uh, sorry, panel hakim. Uh, anda sedang di-mute. Okay. 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 Um, terima kasih Lata atas keberanian Lata berkongsi pengalaman, penghidupan uh, dengan kami semua. Dan bagaimana Lata berusaha ya memperkasakan diri sendiri mengenai hak asasi manusia dan juga hak pekerja seks. Um, saya ada satu soalan. Um, terdapat mendengar um, testimoni Lata tadi terdapat sikap berat sebelah ya terhadap pekerja seks um, ketika um, mereka cuba mendapatkan perkhidmatan kesihatan di hospital ya dan di klinik. Um, and, and ini access to health basic health ini adalah you know, sangat mustahak ya untuk melindungi diri ketika bekerja. Um, selain daripada perkhidmatan kesihatan, apakah perkhidmatan lain ya yang amat penting untuk wanita yang bekerja di industri seks? Terima kasih, um, Lata. Um, terima kasih atas jemputan saya. Um, saya ada dapat lapan uh, jawapan. Jadi saya perkhidmatan itu saya nak bagi lapan jawapan ya. Nombor satu, pekerja seks perlukan tempat kerja yang lebih selamat. Kini lebih banyak brotel sering direk oleh polis pihak dan pihak agama. Kebanyakan pekerja seks sudah diketuai oleh polis dan selalu ditarget oleh polis. Walaupun pada masa mereka hanya keluar untuk makan atau shopping, ramai pekerja seks perlu pergi underground 
untuk menuruskan kerja mereka. Ini menyebabkan perlindungan yang mereka dapat dari pemiliki brothel, termasuk perlindungan dari keganasan. Sudah tiada lagi. Media juga perlu dididikkan dan disensitaiskan agar tidak mendedahkan maklumat tentang nama dan lokasi pekerja seks. Nombor tiga, rate dan tangkapan polis semakin meningkat. Dalam keadaan ini, pekerja seks perlu akses kepada perkhidmatan peguam dan murah. Kebanyakan pekerja seks tidak mengetahui tentang hak mereka dan terpaksa hanya bergantung pada kapten dari brothel untuk menyelamatkan mereka. Nombor, lim, nombor empat, ramai pekerja seks kehilangan kerja mereka semasa COVID-19. Kini mereka perlukan lebih maklumat tentang skim bantuan kerajaan untuk menampungkan diri dan mendapatkan sara hidup tambahan. Tetapi kami meminta agar perkhidmatan ekonomi dan bantuan sara hidup tidak berbentuk intervensi, inter, intervensi berdasarkan tangkapan, menyelamatkan dan pemulihan. Nombor lima, pekerja seks perlukan akses kepada perkhidmatan psikosocial atau mental health ter, terutama sekarang sebab COVID-19 ramai yang tidak dapat bekerja dan menanggung keluarga keluarganya. Kes-kes percubaan membunuh diri di kalangan pekerja seks semakin meningkat. Nombor enam, pekerja seks juga perlukan akses kepada rumah kos rendah. Kini pekerja seks tidak dapat akses kepada penyewa, penyewaan dan pembelian rumah sebab tidak dapat menunjukkan pekerjaan atau gaji tetap. Pekerja seks juga tidak dapat mengambil pinjaman bank. Nombor tujuh, mereka juga tidak dapat perkhidmatan EPF, SOKSO dan insurans kesihatan. Kebanyakan tiada perkhidmatan sara hidup semasa tua. Nombor lapan, pekerja seks juga perlukan perkhidmatan kaunseling dan akses kepada rumah perlindungan tanpa prejudis dan stigma lain bila berlaku keganasan dari klien atau keluarga. Ini yang lapan soal jawapan untuk saya dan ada saya nak bagi tahu. It is because of our continued denial of this basic service that we ask that sex work be decriminalized. We ask that all stop being judgmental and discriminatory against sex workers on the basis of their work. Sex workers are human too and have equal rights. Thank you so much for judges to listening. Thank you so much, Lata, for sharing with us these very, very important um, issues and discrimination faced by um, sex workers. And I think like all other discriminated groups of workers, it's really important for us to recognize that all the workers have rights that must be protected. Thank you very much, Lata. And we really hope that the Women's Tribunal will raise, you know, increase awareness um, on um, the discrimination, ex exploitation, um, and the harm, yeah, to your health and, and well-being that um, these discriminations have caused. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you, Zaina, and thank you again, Lata. We have now reached the last witness of the tribunal, but certainly not least. And her name is Minambal Anak Perempuan Ponambalan. This will be the story of witness number 26. She is present here today with us to share her testimony. She will be sharing her testimony about the discrimination faced as a domestic worker and she will be speaking in Tamil. With us today also, we have Irene Xavier from Persatuan Sahabat Wanita Selangor, who will be interpreting Minambal's testimony in English. 
Uh, sebelum itu saya ingin memperingatkan um, saksi untuk bercakap dengan perlahan. Sekarang saya ingin jemput Puan Minambal dan Irene Xavier untuk menyampaikan testimoni Puan Minambal. Silakan Puan. Assalamualaikum. En per Minambal, saya pernah per Puan Minambal. En Vit Mogaveri, Kota Damansara, Kota Dinjaya. En Terman Terke Perge, Nan Airti Dona Airti, En Beti Mondra Mande, Palaya Subang Wimana Nilai Terkari Gilulda, Filmo Reskedi, Paul Mara Mitum, Soli Dali Aga, Veri Seya Armite, Apodati Yanaka Vaidu, Sumar Irba Dilirende, Irba Sain Jepul Yirkom, Filmo Torta Til Varandanan, Filmo Torta Til Var. Filmor tonton til badan danan, pal mara betum soli lenen, suru bayi itu modale, katru paling iya dan, ada itu ramai yang anak murai el, saya mudik mudik pergi, yang aku kai bandar kali lagi de, air itu tola air itu, yang pas saya tam ande, nanggal wasi te, bani sejuk bandar, filmor tonton mereka bertu bete de, yang re, anda eset adi karyal, terima kita bete de, agave nanggal, enggal bani ye ilan dom, adan pin Nanggal pal marah betul, wapan dah tulis alia gak. Ada aja contract worker saja, tote kira ye, berada ke amat terpotong. Naa nargi leh rende, nagar gora, nagar gora magia, kampung lamba, endra. Ida tuh sonda marga, marah biri kati kondel, puri amar de. Yen berada ye ilan dah terkite, naa yen dah ilah pidum, awal gara wasa merende perabil lay. Angge wapan dah tulis alia gak. Ada aja contract worker endra, adi pada yen kiri, berada sejum, wogor nado. Yang kalau kesambalan, barang kesambalan macam ni barang kita perhati. Per, per yang dah kerja niom, angge. Puan Minambal, ya. Puan Minambal boleh bercakap dengan lebih jelas dan perlahan sedikit, dan mungkin bercakap sedikit sedikit. Selepas itu, Puan Irene akan menterjemah Puan Minambal. Boleh? Boleh. Okay, thank you. Terima kasih. Anda sarjaya um, barangnya pada beli. Angge iran dua barang dengan beli sejajar yang kalau ke, EPF sokso, itu um korang pada beli. Agave, nanggal bersatuan sabat wanita Selangor, yangno Selangor Magelir, Nafuraviya kat daya ni, murai itu, abar galin, udah bi udan, toli lada gal, toli idam, puga raliga, yang kalau ke, EPF, yangno woi budiya seman ini, seman ini, sanda panamu. Matram sokso ayano samoga nala padu bapu kapi itu bariya sanda panamu abar kerbasa merende barangga patagi. My name is Minambal. After my marriage in 1983, I started to work in Pilmo Estate near the old Subang Airport. In when I was in my early 20s, I grew up on a plantation. And tapping rubber was one job that I was very skilled in. In 1985, we were told that the estate was sold and we lost our jobs. We were employed as contract workers to tap the rubber trees. I lived nearby in an urban pioneer community called Kampong Lemba, where we built our own wooden house. I received no compensation for losing my job. In contract work, we were paid for every day that we work and not one cent more. Even in those two years, we had to, flee, we had to file a complaint in the labor department with the help of Persatan Sabat Manita to get our employer to pay us EPF and SOCSO. Pal marah betul beli yang hilang dah pergi. Dan sumar mondu baru dengan pelaya subang bimana nilai itu. Wapan dah tuli lari aga. Ada aje contract worker yang dah adi pada yang kiri. Super tu tuli lari aga. Beli kita ni. Air itu tola air itu. Entah tuan benda mana de. Nanggal kuli yang dah film or essay. Matram yang ada video di yang dah film. Minum bimana kati de. Abi berdiri kaga. Fine berdiri tapi berpadal. Baru beri om, nan, yang ada di bida ini lande, nanggal mumpet kudi yang ada anda bide, samudra palar pali aga, adabu de kinda hari naga pain berita pata dal, makal togai kanak kanak palar gal, yang bide ini palar pali aga we, padin de bitar gal, adan pin palamoyat cikal seida perage, 
இழப்பீடாக எங்களுக்கு மாற்று வீடு பெற்றுத் தருவதாக பெற்று உதவுவதாக உறுதியளிக்க அரசியல் கட்சி பிறகு கொடுத்த வாங்கினை நிறைவேற்றவில்லை பிறகு என் குடும்பம் என் மாமியார் குடியிருந்த நகர்புறமாகிய கம்பொங் கயுவாரா என்னும் பகுதிக்கு மாறி சென்றது நாங்கள் குடியிருந்த இடத்திற்கு பக்கத்தில் நடுத்தர வர்க்க குடியிருப்பாளர்கள் குடியிருப்பாளர்களின் வீடுகள் அதிகம் இருந்தது ஆகவே நானும் என் குடும்ப வருமானத்திற்காக அங்கேயே வீட்டு வேலை செய்யும் தொழிலாளியாக மாறினேன் அக்காலகட்டத்தில் வீட்டு வேலைக்காக நான் பெற்ற வருமானத்தின் விவரத்தினை கீழே விவரித்துள்ளேன் அதாவது நான் ஒரு தொழிலாளியின் வீட்டில் வாரத்தில் இரண்டு நாட்கள் வேலை செய்தால் என் சம்பளம் நாற்பது ரிங்கிட் மட்டுமே பிறகு நாங்கள் ஒன்றன் பின் ஒன்றாக கடந்து செல்ல அங்கு மக்களின் பழக்கத்தினால் அங்கேயே வேலை செய்ய எனக்கு அதிக வீடுகள் கிடைத்தன டிசம்பர் ஆயிரத்தி தொள்ளாயிரத்தி எண்பத்தி ஒன்பதாம் ஆண்டு நான் டமன்சரா உத்தமருக்கு சென்று வீட்டு வேலை செய்து வந்தேன் as a contract worker in the old subang estate for about 3 years in 1989 filmo estate and the land where my house stood on was going to be redeployed and i lost my house this house was partly used as a community kindergarten and was recorded as a kindergarten by the surveyors the political party that promised to help us get alternative housing as compensation refused to allow me to get a house then my family moved to another area kampong kayu ara where my mother in law lived then i started to work as a domestic worker because there was middle class housing in the vicinity this is an example of how much i was paid I work for 40 ringgit uh 40 ringgit for work for 2 days in a week with one employer. Then I got more houses to work in. In December 1989 I worked in the Damansara Utama area. Adan peragu 1990 am aandu enakku 100 ringgit sambalathirku vaarathil 3 naatkal endra adipadaiyin keel வீட்டு வேலை கிடைத்தது அந்த ரீதியில் வேலை செய்த நான் ஒரு மாதத்திற்கு நானூத்தி ஐம்பது ரிங்கிட்டில் இருந்து ஐநூறு ரிங்கிட் வரை வருமானம் பெற்றேன் எங்கள் பிரச்சனை என்னவெனில் குறைந்த நேரத்தில் வேலை செய்யவோ அல்லது அதிக ஊதியம் கேட்கவோ வாய்ப்பில்லை எங்கள் நிலைமை ஒன்று முதலாளியின் வேண்டுகோளுக்கு இணங்கி வேலை செய்வது அல்லது வேலையை விட்டு செல்வது என்ற சூழ்நிலையாகும் நான் நோய்வாக்கப்பட்டு விடுப்பு எடுக்க நேரிட்டால் எனக்கு அன்றைய தின ஊதியம் வழங்கப்படாது முதலாளியை முதலாளியும் அதை பற்றி கண்டு கொள்ள மாட்டார் அக்காலகட்டத்தில் நான் வேலைக்கு செல்ல நிதி வண்டியினை பயன்படுத்தினேன் ஒரு நாள் வழக்கம் போல் வீட்டு வேலை செய்யும் தொழிலாளி ஒருவர் சக தொழிலாளி வேலை முடிந்து வீடு திரும்பும் வழியில் விபத்தில் சிக்கி பரிதாபமாக இறந்துவிட்டார் ஆகவே அக்குடும்பம் அவரின் வருமானமின்றி மிகவும் கஷ்டத்துக்குள்ளானது அந்த நிகழ்வுக்கு பின் நிலைமையினை புரிந்து கொண்டு இபிஎஃப் மற்றும் சொக்சோ முக்கியத்துவத்தினை உணர்ந்து அச்சலுகில் மற்ற தொழிலாளர்களை போல் எங்களுக்கும் வழங்கப்பட வேண்டும் என விரும்பினோம் ஆக நாங்கள் எங்கள் குடியிருப்பு பகுதியில் வீட்டு வேலை செய்யும் பெண் தொழிலாளர்களை பர்சத்வான் சபாட் வனிதா ஸ்லாங்கூர் என்னும் ஸ்லாங்கூர் மகளிர் நட்புறவு உத இயக்கத்தின் உதவியுடன் ஒன்றிணைந்து முதலில் நாங்கள் பனிரெண்டு வீட்டு பணியாளர்களை கொண்ட ஒரு குழு ஒன்றினை உருவாக்கினோம் அதன் பின் நாங்கள் எங்கள் முதலாளிகளிடம் தனித்தனியாக இபிஎஃப் சொக்சோ போன்ற எங்களுக்கான சலுகைகளை பற்றி கேட்ட பிறகு மூன்று முதலாளிகள் மட்டுமே இபிஎஃப் சொக்சோ வாரியத்தை வாரியத்தில் நாங்கள் வீட்டு பணியாளர்களை பதிவு செய்தனர் என்னுடைய முதலாளி முதலாளியை நான் கேட்ட பொழுது மறுத்துவிட்டார் மேலும் இஷ்டம் இருந்தால் வேலை செய் இல்லாவிட்டால் நின்றுவிடு என்று கூறிவிட்டார் எனக்கு வருமானம் தேவை என்பதால் நானும் அதற்கு மேல் எதுவும் கேட்காமல் வேலையை தொடர்ந்து செய்தேன் நாங்கள் குடியிருந்த நிலமும் முன்பு குடியிரு குடியிருந்த மேம்பாட்டிற்காக ஒதுக்கப்பட்டிருப்பதால் 
மறுபடியும் நாங்கள் எங்கள் வீட்டை வீடுகளை இழந்தோம் பின் தற்காலிகமாக கட்டி கொடுத்த நீண்ட வீட்டிற்கு அதாவது ரூமா பஞ்சா மாறி போனோம் அங்கிருந்த பின்னர் நான் குறைந்த விலை அடுக்குமாடி வீட்டிற்கு மாறி சென்றேன் இன்று வரை அங்கேதான் வாழ்ந்து கொண்டு வருகிறேன் I used to earn about 450 or 500 ringgit a month. Our problems were I had no opportunity to ask for higher wages or shorter hours. It was a take or leave it situation. If I take sick leave, I would not be paid. I used a bicycle to travel to work. We used to gather other domestic workers together and form A, domestic, a group of domestic workers in Sahabat Wanita. We wanted to ask for EPF and SOCSO for domestic workers after one worker died in an accident on her way back from work. After a group of 12 form, we asked our employers individually. Only three employers registered their domestic workers for EPF and SOCSO This was because they had companies and they put these domestic workers on their payroll and the women received EPF and SOCSO. The other employers did not want to take the trouble to register their domestic workers in SOCSO or EPF as it was not mandatory for them. My employer refused and I, and I was told to stop work if i insisted this was said to be verbally so because i needed the income i just continued this campo where i lived was also earmarked for development and we lost our houses once again i then moved to the long house that the developer provided from there i later moved to a low cost flat where i live in till today inga eduthu kaataga ondru koorugiren 23 varadangalaga ore mudalaaliyidam veli seidhen oru vaarathil 2 mani neram veli seidhal maadam 40 valli 40 ringe sambalamaga kedaikkum pin 23 varadathukku piragu sila koodudalana veli kelai seiya solli maadam 240 ringe sambalamaga koduthar Okay. I give an example of an employer I worked for for 23 years. I started at 40 ringgit a month for 2 hours of work a week. Then the wages increased until the 23rd year of employment when I earned 240 ringgit a month with a few added tasks and 2 hours a day sometimes stretch longer than that. இன்று நாங்கள் பெறும் வருமானம் மிக குறைவுதான் நான் புலம்பெயர்ந்து இங்கே வந்து வேலை செய்யும் வெளிநாட்டு வீட்டு பணியாளர்களை விட மிக குறைவாகவே சம்பாதிக்கிறேன் ஏன் என் முதலாளி கூறிய காரணம் மறுபடியும் இங்கே கூறுகிறேன் அதாவது வெளிநாட்டு வீ வெளிநாட்டு வீட்டு பணியாளர்கள் காலை ஐந்து அல்லது ஆறு மணிக்கு வேலையை தொடங்கி நள்ளிரவு வரை செய்து முடிப்பார்கள் நாங்கள் கூறும் அனைத்து வேலைகளையும் செய்வார்கள் உதாரணமாக வீட்டில் செல்ல பிராணிகளை குளிப்பாட்டுவது குழந்தைகளை பாலர் பள்ளிக்கு அழைத்து செல்வது குழந்தைகளை கவனிப்பது போன்ற அனைத்து வேலைகளையும் செய்வார்கள் ஆனால் நீங்கள் ஒப்புக்கொண்ட வேலையை மட்டுமே குறிப்பிட்ட மணி நேரங்களில் செய்கிறீர்கள் ஆக பொதுவாகவே உங்களுடைய வருமானம் குறைவுதான் குறைவுதான் என்ற வீட்டு வீட்டு வேலைக்கு வீட்டு வேலைக்கு என்று குறைந்தபட்ச ஊதியம் கிடையாது அதாவது மாதாந்திர ஊதியமோ மணி நேர ஊதியமோ இல்லை டுடே ஐ ஸ்டில் earn very little in fact i earn less than the migrant domestic workers why let me repeat what my employer said foreign domestic workers start work at 5 or 6 in the morning and only stop work close to midnight 
They also do everything, bathe the pets, take the children to preschool, mind the children, for example. You only work for the hours that we have arranged and only the tasks that we have agreed upon. So naturally you earn less. There is no minimum wage for domestic work, either a monthly rate or an hourly rate. If I leave my job, I have no income or savings. I need a minimum of 1,100 ringgit to cover utilities, 300, transport, uh, sorry, utilities, 200, transport, 300, and food, 600. I try to earn more by selling jasmine flowers for other needs like clothes, motorbike, repairs, maintenance and repairs, festivals and emergencies. In addition to this, my health problems are many. I have developed severe allergies to the detergents I use. I also suffer from breathlessness when I use Clorox. So I have to seek treatment which cost me about 400 ringgit a month at my own expense. The doctor advised me to stop doing this type of work, but how can I survive? My colleagues also suffer from similar conditions. <laughs> தொழிலாளர்களின் சட்டத்தில் மற்ற எல்லா தொழிலாளர்களுக்கும் வழங்கப்படும் உரிமைகள் சலுகைகள் மற்றும் பாதுகாப்பு யாவும் எங்களை போன்ற வீட்டு வேலை செய்யும் பெண் தொழிலாளர்களுக்கு கிடைக்க வேண்டும் சட்டத்தில் மாற்றம் செய்து அமல்படுத்த வேண்டும் மூன்றாவது வீட்டு வேலை செய்யும் தொழிலாளி தொழிலாளர்களுக்கான தொழிற்சங்கம் அதாவது யூனியன் என்னும் ஒரு அமைப்பினை அமைத்தல் வேண்டும் Number one, domestic work should be considered as work. Two, domestic workers should have all rights as workers, all the rights accorded to workers in our laws and enjoy protection like other workers. We should have the right to form a trade union of domestic workers. நான் ஒரு பெண் என்பதால் என்னிடம் பாகுபாடு காட்டப்படுகிறது என்பது எனக்கு நன்றாகவே தெரியும் நமது கலாச்சாரமும் முதலாளிமார்களும் வீட்டு வேலை வீட்டு வேலை என்பது சாதாரணமாக எல்லா பெண்களும் செய்யும் வேலை என்று நினைக்கிறார்கள் மேலும் அது ஏழை பெண்கள் செய்யும் வேலை என்று கருதுகிறார்கள் நான் என் முதலாளியிடம் சம்பள உயர்வு கேட்ட பொழுது வழக்கமாக கொடுக்கும் சம்பளம் மட்டுமே கொடுக்க முடியும் 
அதிகம் கூட்டி கொடுக்க முடியாது என்று கூறிவிட்டார் காரணம் நான் இல்லை எனிலும் வேறு வேலையாட்கள் அவர்களால் தேடிக்கொள்ள முடியும் மற்றவர் மற்றவர்களின் கண்ணோட்டத்தில் வீட்டு வேலை என்பது பெண்கள் மட்டுமே செய்யக்கூடிய வேலை என்று பரவலாக ஒரு கருத்து உள்ளது ஏழை பெண் ஒருவர் வருமானத்திற்காக வீட்டு வேலை செய்தால் அவரை வீட்டு பணியாளர் அல்லது வீட்டு வேலைக்காரி என்று அழைக்கிறார்கள் அதுபோல் குழந்தை காப்பகம் சிறுவர் சிறுமியர் காப்பகம் முதியோர் காப்பகம் போன்ற இடத்தில் உள்ள வேலை பெண்களுக்கான வேலை என்று கருதும் பரவலாக உள்ளது அதனால் பல வருடங்களாகவே மலேசிய நாட்டின் தொழிலாளர்களுக்கான சட்டம் பெண் தொழிலாளர்களை பாராபட்சமாகவே நடத்தி வருகிறது இந்த சட்டம் பெண் தொழிலாளர்களுக்கு சாதகமாக இல்லை அதே சமயம் பெண் தொழிலாளர்களுக்கு எதிராக மாற்று பாகுபாடும் காட்டியும் வருகிறது Finally, I want to say that I know that I am discriminated against because I am a woman. Our culture and all my employers think that housework is work that all women do, especially poor women. When I ask for a raise, they say that this is all they are willing to pay. It is easy for them to find another woman to do housework which is after all not skilled in their opinion and most women can do it housework is related to being a woman in most people's eyes if a woman is poor enough to ask to do paid housework then she becomes a domestic worker this is the same for care of infants or care of children and the elderly in it is all regarded as women's work this is why for so many years the employment act has discriminated against us women and is still discriminating against us thank you terima kasih puan minambal kerana berkongsi testimoni puan dan and thank you to irene for interpreting minambal's story uh, may i ask the panel of judges if you have any comments to minambal minambal ungala kelvi kekka poradilla neenga unga nelame romba nalla vivarama solitinga ana ungitta nandri solanum indha sambhavathil kalandukondu ungalude varalara engaloda pagandukondadukaga ungalukku enga manamaarna nandriyai theruvithukolgiram nandri thank you vanakkam thank you Thank you very much to all the judges. Thank you once again. Terima kasih banyak Puan Minambal. Terima kasih. Terima kasih. Now, this is the end of the witnesses uh, testimonies. We are incredibly thankful to all of our witnesses who have shared their stories, their testimonies courageously. Terima kasih banyak lagi kepada semua saksi-saksi kita. The, it is now time for lunch break and we will break until 2:15 uh, pm after lunch we will have the advocate statements so do come back for the exciting uh, session uh, i hope to see everyone here back at 2:15 and thank you have a good lunch break and we look forward to listening the advocate statements at 2:15 pm kita sekarang akan ada uh, masa rehat. Kita akan kembali pada pukul 2.15 petang. Terima kasih.
good afternoon. Selamat petang semua. Welcome back to the Women's Tribunal. I hope everyone has have had a good lunch break. It is now 2.15 p.m. And we will start off with the advocate statements. We will have uh, advocate statements from by eight advocates today. And the advocate statements will consist of the context, situational analysis, assessment of state interventions and recommendations based on the specific themes. Uh, we will start, but uh, before that, just a note to all of the advocates. Uh, we hope that you can keep to the time allocated for you. Thank you very much. The first advocate we will be inviting Ms. Hani Tan to uh, present her advocate statement. Ms. Hani Tan is a feminist lawyer. She will be presenting under the theme of constitutional and legal framework. You may start. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, women's experiences are at the center of this women's tribunal, but it would not surprise anyone that this key group, women, was lacking in the drafting of the federal constitution. And still, there are only 33 women out of the 222 members of Dewan Rakya, or around 14%. Women's engagement with the law has a checkered history. Law has been used to enable women to claim their rights, but so very often it has been used to discriminate against them. Over the last two days, we have heard how the law has failed the many types of women who live in Malaysia. My presentation will be in three parts, uh, constitutional and legal framework, uh, feminist analysis of the law, and a few recommendations. The first, constitutional and legal framework. We have a federal constitution, a written constitution, unlike uh, in, the, in the United Kingdom where they have an unwritten constitution. Our federal constitution in article four states that the constitution itself is the supreme law of Malaysia. There is formal equality in Malaysia because we have article 8.1 that says all persons are equal before the law and entitled to the equal protection of the law. In the federal constitution itself, we have this doctrine called the doctrine of the separation of powers. This means that the legislature, which is you know, the parliament, the state assemblies, the executive, which is essentially the cabinet, and the judiciary are all separate, even though they form the government. Um, and they're meant to act as checks and balances one against the other. This is so that no one arm of government can rule Malaysia. So when parliament or uh, state legislature enact laws that infringe on any of our rights, it is the judiciary that corrects the wrongs. This includes when the laws are passed to change something fundamental uh, in the federal constitution affecting our rights. So for example, in the Indira Gandhi case, um, she filed the case to challenge you know, uh, the issuance of um, the conversion certificate for her children uh, by her husband alone without her knowledge. Uh, and that was held to be you know, unlawful. So this basic structure doctrine means that the legislature's power to make laws has limits. It cannot pass laws that will take away fundamental features, protections and rights set out in the federal constitution. The judiciary will declare such laws void. And Article 8.2 is something that women look to when claiming their rights. It provides that there shall be no discrimination on a few grounds, and one of the grounds is gender. But how has it been interpreted? So in the federal court case, federal court is the highest court in the land. Uh, in the federal court case of Beatrice Fernandez, that was interpreted to mean that women can only avail themselves of that protection under Article 8.2 if some law or action was uh, done by the executive uh, to discriminate against her. So this means that if a private company discriminates against a woman, 
there is no protection for her. That is why Rafiza could not make Air Asia liable for discontinuing her service because she was pregnant. On the other hand, you had No Fadila who sued the government successfully and was compensated when she did not get her job because she was pregnant. That's because the pers the, uh, it was the education ministry that basically discriminated against her. On the other hand, we also have uh, international law. So Malaysia has acceded to CEDAW in 1995. Uh, that is a, a treaty, which basically means there's a formal um, you know, signing and saying that, okay, we agree to be bound by CEDAW. So it is binding on Malaysia and it must be performed by our government in good faith. However, we are what we call a dualist country, which basically means that when the executive goes out there to sign something, it still has to pass through parliament to make it you know, into hard law, right? Um, so the problem with CEDAW is that it has not been uh, domesticated. Uh, that's because only bits and pieces of uh, uh, CEDAW were actually you know, incorporated in some parts of our law and also our constitution. So Article 8.2 was actually amended, taking into account our obligation to CEDAW and certain other laws, you know, uh, like uh, say, for example, you know, the Distribution Act that affects uh, non-Muslim women to make, uh, you know, people who die, the husbands who die without the will, that will enable the wives to also inherit. Previously, uh, sorry, it's the other way around. When the wives die, um, Sorry, it's actually it's correct. It's actually when the husband dies, then the wife uh, should also be able to, to inherit that. Um, so in a very recent case uh, of Sundar Raju, our Chief Justice, uh, Tengku Maimun, had said that where the legislation is ambiguous and is capable of an interpretation which favours international law, the courts ought not to put the state or other branches of government in a position which could render them in breach of international law, whether it be conventional international law, which is the treaty law like CEDAW, or customary international law. So if we were to couple the basic structure doctrine and the principles of human rights, um, it can form a powerful frame on which women can claim their rights. I will now move on to the second part of my presentation, uh, which is the feminist analysis of law. And I will look at five areas. The first is intersectionality and complex identities. Discrimination is rarely based on one uh, identity of a person. When we listen to the evidence of Ju, Selvi, Tharani, and Rokia, it became clear that they were discriminated because of their gender identity, work, race, and or religion. The government ought to legally recognize this intersecting form of discrimination and how the negative effects on those discrimination are compounded. The second area is implicit bias and male norms. In considering women's multiple experiences, they will encounter implicit male bias when it comes to setting standards and the making of rules and laws that appear neutral and objective. These male norms often have unintended negative impact on women. These male-centered standards derive their power from being accepted without criticism as universal. This is highlighted in, in the case of Siti No, the engineer, where she worked in a male-dominated profession. In her office, it was acceptable to make sexist jokes and that an unmarried woman, well, you know, it was okay for her to work long hours. And on the other hand, she was de often denied uh, overseas postings. The third area is double binds and dilemmas of difference. Women workers are often caught in what, what is a catch-22 or a no-win situation. Huh? So they're on the one hand, they're required to be feminine, you know, be slim, wear makeup, wear high heels, and yet possess masculine traits like be competitive, go out drinking until late and participate in sexist jokes. It is a tough balancing act and women workers should not have to put up with that kind of work culture. Women workers often end up still being discriminated however they behave. The sports pundit 
uh, witness gave her evidence that illustrates this conundrum. The fourth area is reproducing patterns of dominance. Sexism and gender discrimination are resilient and they're so resistant to change. They alter and often are updated, enabling male dominance to continue. Uh, changes are not inherently progressive and may not bring about major improvements in women's lives. Working from home, for example, has not been a blessing to all women. The COVID-19 pandemic and the long periods of lockdowns have negatively affected women disproportionately. Uh, domestic violence increase are uh, taken on toll of women's health, especially mental health and financial well-being, you know. And most mothers took on a bigger share in facilitating the children's uh, learning because the children also had to learn from home. Uh, and so this is over and above, uh, you know, their share of household responsibilities. And we also heard from Indira Gandhi, the federal court had handed down the progressive and sensible judgment on universal uh, conversion of children to Islam and their custody. But despite that, she is still unable to reunite with her youngest daughter, patriarchal forces and the lack of concerted effort by the government in a situation that is complicated by politics and religion have conspired to keep them apart. And the final area is unpacking choices. Women's continued subordination is frequently attributed to their own choice huh? and told that they are responsible for the results that follow from their own choice. So choices actually imply that a woman has real alternatives huh? and making that decision represents her authentic preference. But this ignores the fact that choices are not made in a vacuum, you know. Our culture and customary practices bear heavily on many choices made by women. We heard from a Malaysian woman who married uh, an Indonesian uh, who gave birth to her daughter in Indonesia as she did not have enough money to return to Malaysia. She was then forced to so-called choose to obtain Indonesian citizenship and passport for her daughter so that at least the daughter could travel with her back to Malaysia. And now the daughter is facing great difficulties in obtaining a Malaysian citizenship. And this is also when Zaina was asking the question, of, oh, you know, Sharia law and they, you know, allows women to claim maintenance for the children. Why aren't you doing it? You know, and, and the reason is because out of all the choices that she had to make, she chose the children over money. So finally, recommendations. Huh? Um, we should enact a separate equality law. Women's groups are calling for a gender equality law. The government ought to amend or repeal laws which discriminate against women. A key example is to uh, repeal the exception in section 375 of the penal code so to criminalize marital rape. More legal aid should be made available, available to women as it remains a major stumbling block to them having access to justice. And this includes primarily the altering, amending the criteria that determines who may receive legal aid. Is it only Malaysians? Must you earn below like 500 ringgit? You know, uh, and, and I can tell you from have, uh, you know, experiencing the, the vast legal aid and also the one which is given by the government, you have to be very poor for you to actually receive legal aid. And actors in the justice chain, such as law and policy makers, the police, doctors, social workers, lawyers, and the judiciary, ought to receive regular training on gender awareness and sens sensitization. Key components of such workshop should include understanding gender stereotyping and its harm, and women's perspectives of the law. One of the changes brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic is that now virtual hearings, trials, and appeals are increasingly common. Judges have indicated to us that the changes are here to stay. Meanwhile, lawyers are struggling to come to terms with this new reality. Women litigants and witnesses who are not familiar or not comfortable with technology will struggle. So as will women who are poor and or live in rural Malaysia. Until the impact of virtual trials become more clear, they should only be conducted on an urgent basis. So in closing, um, knowledge is power. The government ought to increase its outreach to women to inform them of their rights and simultaneously gender awareness programs for all three branches of government should increase. 
Women's human rights should not be illusory. It ought to be enjoyed in all its glory. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hani. Uh, that was perfectly 15 minutes. Thank you. Uh, now, <laughs> I'd like to invite now our panel of judges if you have any questions for Hani. No, we don't have any questions. Hani gave an excellent, um, thoughtful um, presentation for us to consider when we come out with our findings. Thank you very much, Hani. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you judges and thank you very much, Hani. Um, I'd like to uh, remind the advocates to, um, because the interpreters, they request to go a bit slower. So uh, when you're speaking to, to go a bit slower, thank you. The following theme will be presented by Vivian Kwan and Hana Nanari. They are both practicing lawyers and will be presenting their advocate statement under the theme of economy. First, uh, we'd like to invite Vivian Kwan. Thank you very much, Gazelle, and good afternoon to the esteemed judges. My name is Vivian Kwan. Together with me is Hena Nanari, my co-advocate for the theme of economy. Right, so we've prepared some slides because we will actually be handling seven witnesses collectively. Um, why so many witnesses? We all know that issues relating to economy, in other words, issues relating to wages, employment, protection at workplace, and the lack thereof, affects all women, regardless of ethnicity, religion, type of career or background. This issue cuts across all demographics. So I will be dealing with the first four witnesses, whereas my co-advocate Nanari will be dealing with the remaining three. For the purposes of these proceedings, we will not go into the factual elements because uh, the witnesses have already done so very well and very extensively in the past two days. We will focus more on the current legislations and recommendations. Now, I would start with Minambal. She was the final witness uh, that testified earlier today. Minambal is a rubber tapper on contract. And the estate that she was working at was sold off. She has lost her job at that time and she did not receive any compensation. Thereafter, she continued to seek another job to work as a cleaner, again on contract. And this was at the Subang Old Airport. And there she lost her home. She lost her home when the estate was relocated and redeveloped. She did not receive any alternate housing or compensation. After losing her home, she decided to look for another job and she started embarking to work as a domestic worker where she earned 450 to 500 ringgit a month. She had no opportunity to ask for higher wages or shorter hours. She has no sick leave, no med medical benefits. And throughout her job, her career, she developed health problems because she was exposed to detergents and bleaching agents. Now, of course, she sought protection from her employer. She uh, tried to you know, request to register for EPF and SOXO benefits, but the employers refused and asked her to stop work if she persisted. Now, this is a systemic discrimination by employers and as further exacerbated as a result of inadequate protection under the Employment Act 1995. No written contract, no specific legislation to govern the rights of domestic workers. She is susceptible to wage discrimination and forced labor, which results in extended hours of labor and not afforded basic protections such as right to seek leave. Now, minimum wages, as we all know, are applicable to all workers, 
but did you know they are not applicable to domestic workers? They are unable to enjoy adequate housing, which is afforded under the UN Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which protects against forced eviction and arbitrary destruction and demolition of one's home. They do not enjoy this protection. Now, our current legislation which is the Employment Act, gives some benefits. Like for example, mi um, provided minimum number of work days in a month, maternity protection, rest days, termination, layoff, and retirement benefits. However, domestic workers are excluded from these benefits. I'll return to minimum wage. As I've mentioned just now, domestic workers are still not considered part of the national workforce and therefore ineligible for protection of a minimum wage. What about EPF and SOXO benefits? For EPF, domestic workers are defined under Section 3 of the Workmen's Compensation Act and are not liable to contribute to EPF. So as a result, workers like Minambal are at the mercy of employers who are free to refuse EPF contributions. How about SOXO? Now, since June this year, 2021, registration for domestic workers can be made. However, part-time domestic workers with multiple employers, which is usually the case where domestic workers work for different employers, they are considered self-employed. So as a result, they do not get wages for sick leave. They have no health and safety benefits and they do not have minimum wage. We turn to an international standard, which is the International Labor Convention, the ILO. Now the ILO would ensure that Malaysia takes measures to ensure that all domestic workers enjoy minimum wage coverage. And this includes remuneration, method of calculation, and periodicity of payments, and informed of any other authorized deductions. Malaysia has yet to ratify this convention. And lastly, the ICESR. This would compel Malaysia to provide for the right to adequate housing. Again, Malaysia has yet to ratify this. So there are a few things we would recommend for this issue. That Malaysia sign and ratify both the ILO C189 and R201. We recommend that domestic workers are included in the national minimum wage plan. That government departments, civil society and trade unions as well as private sectors must include and promote a trade union, worker endorsed contract for employment. And lastly, that domestic workers are acknowledged the rights to social security and protection by recognizing their contributions to the national workforce and to be given EPF contribution. Now move on to the second witness, uh, Tharani. Tharani is a hospital cleaner on contract. As we had heard her testimony just now, she identifies as a transgender. However, she has faced non-stop pressure to remove her earrings, to wear men's clothes, to cut her hair short. And this non-stop pressure has led her to the point of being suicidal. So we can just imagine how much pressure she has been facing. Now she has lodged a complaint with the Sitiawan Labor uh, Office, but in return, her employer issued warning letter and she was asked to attend counseling. This is still very much a taboo subject where you know, transgenders are not acceptable in Malaysia. And as a result, there are no legislative frameworks with, which would protect against 
discriminatory actions against this group of people. That's the issue that she's faced on discrimination against her gender identity. What about discrimination in respect of her fair wages? Now, at one point of time, she was not paid over time of 1,211 ringgit. She was actually contracted to work for eight hours, but her employer unilaterally changed her working hours from eight to nine hours without additional pay. And so she sued her employer. Her employer appealed. Uh, the outcome is yet to be seen, uh, yet to be decided. However, the issue is this, the primary contributory factor to this issue is twofold. One, the privatization policy 1983, and two, inadequate protection under the Employment Act 1995. Now, what is this privatization policy, you may ask? Just a bit of a background, in 19, before 1983, Hospital cleaners were actually part of civil service. But after 1983, the then Prime Minister, Dr. Mahathir Mohamed, introduced this national privatization policy, which led to privatization of hospital cleaners' employments under GLCs. Now, what is this? Why, why is this the case? What is the objective? Essentially, to lessen the financial and administrative burden of the government and re to reduce the size and involvement of the public sector in the economy. In other words, to be frank, it is just to cut costs. Companies that are holding these contracts to clean public hospitals are GLCs, all right? They have unilaterally altered terms where employees have little or no bargaining power and they are at the mercy of these companies. This is the plight of hospital cleaners. They work long hours to meet higher hygiene and sanitization standards, especially during this pandemic. Their workload has increased to ensure hospitals are not a hotbed for infection, but they are only rewarded with low and unfair wages, and they do not have any job security as they are contract workers. Now, the Prime Minister's office has denied that hospital workers are frontliners, right? This, this I, I'm, I'm also quite appalled. How are they denied as frontliners? They are not eligible as one of frontliners for one of frontliners allowance during the pandemic. So they started this campaign called Cleaner Jugger Frontliner, which included a peaceful demonstration, uh, which became a nationwide campaign demanding for basic necessities and benefits. Now turning back to the transgender identity issue, this is a fundamental right for every human being to live with the right to dignity despite their gender identity. Now, if you look at the five international instruments before us, this slide, Malaysia is only party to two out of five instruments, those that are highlighted in blue. Owing to the religious and cultural sensitivities of Malaysia, it is challenging to push forth a recognition and respect for the rights and dignity of the transgender community. But this should not be an excuse for us to uphold their rights as human beings and protect them against any violence, harm and discrimination. And therefore, we would implore the government and we would recommend the government to implement fair wages that are corresponding with the workload, not working hours, that the government absorb again all government cleaners as government employees and not privatized contractors, that they provide frontliner allowance to hospital cleaners, and finally, 
formulate and implement policies against harassment, discrimination, and violence in the workplace with a focus on gender expression. Next, I would like to speak about Adelina, the late Adelina Lisao. We would just pause for a minute uh, for the interpreter to change. Thank you. All right. I'm sure that many of us have heard of this tragic story of the late Adelina Lisao. She was told to sleep outside with the family dog with just a straw mat, pillow and blanket. And although neighbors approached to help her, she was in so much fear. She eventually died one day after admit being admitted to hospital due to multiple organ failure. Now, a domestic worker's job should not be a dangerous job. And unfortunately, this is not the first case. As most of you would remember, in 2008, an employer was jailed for scalding a domestic worker with hot iron. And again, tragically, in 2014, another employer was charged for starving, star starving a domestic worker to death. Now back to Adelina Lisao. The employer was charged with murder. In April 2019, unfortunately, the DPP dropped the murder charge. Upon instructions from her superior, it was reported that she, was, she has asked the case to uh, be discharged, not amounting to acquittal, i.e. DNAA. And the, the trial judge, having considered the facts and there being no reason to give this DNA, then discharged the employer from any charges against her. The AGC then appealed to the Court of Appeal. Court of Appeal agreed with the High Court. Now the case is up in the Federal Court in December. Now, we shall refrain from commenting on the judicial process as it is still ongoing. But what we will do is shed light on the issues that are surrounding this and recommendations for reform. As we all know, there had been an Indonesian ban, understandably, because it caused an uproar from Indonesia. And previously, a two-year ban on sending migrant workers to Malaysia from 2009 to 2011. Following Adelina's death, the Indonesian government considered reinstating the ban against Malaysia by halting the recruitment of Indonesian domestic workers to Malaysia. The Indonesian ambassador to Malaysia proposed the ban in hopes of working on restricting the employment and administration process with the aim of mending diplomatic ties between the two countries, following all these repeated cases of abuse of domestic workers. Then we turn to our employment laws. As highlighted just now, employment laws do not apply to foreign domestic workers. And unfortunately, there is no specific piece of legislation or any laws which provide basic protection for domestic workers. The primary terms of employment and agreement appears to be one between the employer and the agency which supplies these domestic workers. There is no contract between the employer directly with the domestic worker themselves. So it's always with the, the employer and the agent, not the domestic worker themselves. Now there are amendments to the Employment Act recently. We've seen the employment bill being tabled and domestic servant, the term domestic servant was changed to domestic employees. However, the bill does not introduce any additional rights, any new rights for them. 
the first schedule exclusion still applies and there are no provision for rest days for them. Now we turn to, of course, the standard, the gold standard that we have yet to achieve, the ILO. Malaysia has yet to ratify the C189 and R201. Now, if the C189, if ratified, it would apply to all domestic workers and compel Malaysia to take measures to ensure the effective promotion and protection of human rights of all domestic workers. Domestic workers would enjoy effective protection against all forms of abuse, harassment, and violence. The ratification of these conventions is necessary to ensure that for foreign domestic workers enjoy the same legal protection as local domestic workers. And this would definitely improve diplomatic ties between Malaysia and Indonesia. Now, what do we recommend in, in terms of this issue? To sign and ratify the convention, to recognize social security and social protection and develop mechanisms for reporting and complaints wherever there's an, an infringement of right or abuse, to revise policies and guidelines to di allow direct hiring as opposed to contractual arrangements with these agents. And lastly, transparency on the joint efforts of joint task force pursuant to the revised MOU with the Malaysian government. Now, lastly, for my part, I will speak about Saraswati and uh, thereafter I'll invite uh, our esteemed, ju esteemed judges to um, ask any questions before we move on. So for Saraswati, she, um, her testimony was in the capacity as the executive secretary of the union and her personal experience in, exp um, in facing discrimination. Now she has started working in the 1919, uh, 1990s as at the height of privatization, and she has seen firsthand the impact of privatization on women in the B40. Out of 50,000 cleaners, 85% of them are women. They are single mothers, they are sole breadwinners. They have fixed term contract system by concessionaires that do not guarantee them job security. And what this means is every time when the contract is renewed, it's a brand new contract. So the years of service, 15 years, 20 years, they are not accounted for. Due to this contractual nature, they face low wages. And it is lower than the national poverty line income. Now this is an, a discrimination against the senior employees where their salary would be similar to an employee that has just joined a month ago. Out of five concessionaires, four of them are GLCs, and they should ensure the welfare of hospital workers are accounted for. Now, Saras has also embarked to defend rights of workers, where then she was faced with threats from her employers. And in fact, she was arrested once during a protest and she was treated very poorly in lockup. What does our current legislation provide? Now it appears that hospital cleaners who do manual labor and earn less than 2000 a month are included in the definition of employee under the Employment Act. They should be provided with annual leave, sick leave, termination, layoff, retirement benefits. However, they are contract workers. They do not, they do not have these rights afforded for. Again, we turn to the recently proposed amendments of the Employment Act. And this is on the issue of discrimination where it's actually covered for in the, uh, in the amendment. The DG, the Director General, is 
empowered to inquire into employee employer disputes on discrimination right so the new bill has touched on um, this issue of discrimination they've given the dg powers to make orders where employers can be liable for 50000 fine but crucially discrimination itself discrimination per se it is not an offense non-compliance with the dg's order is additionally there are no definition of what discrimination is and there is neither a definition of discrimination in section 2 um, you know for basic very broad grounds like dis discrimination against gender religion race disabilities as this was proposed in the recent MOHR's proposal. Now it is arguable that harassment by employers at Sarah's workplace may con constitute as discrimination due to her advocate uh, uh, activities, you know, like um, uh, protesting and all that. However, the provisions on the new bill are unclear as to what discrimination. So what do we recommend? We recommend that the Ministry of Human Resources review and revise the terms of privatization policy and review the conduct and contracts issued by these concessionaires and whether they are actually in line with the Employment Act. And lastly, we propose the amendments to the Employment Act, the bill that's recently been tabled, to require, to require more clarity and recognition of the rights and benefits to hospital cleaners. And so that concludes my uh, part of the advocate statement. Uh, before we uh, go on to uh, my co-advocate, I would invite the judges to um, ask any questions if there are. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Vivian. Um, you know, for your for your presentation, um, I have two sets of um, two questions. One on the issue of domestic workers, the other on the issue of contract workers, which will also cover the case of Rosia that your colleague will present um, afterwards. I'm just wondering, you know, it, in the case of domestic workers, they're not recognised as workers, yeah, under the Employment Act. In the case of contract workers, they are recognized as workers in the Employment Act, and yet it doesn't seem to make a difference. Both sets of workers are grossly exploited and discriminated against, and the government and the employers remain deaf and dumb to all the pleas um, you know, and actions, advocacy actions that have been taken by the workers and their um, associations. So I'm just wondering, first of all, what is it that, what it takes yeah, to get the government to move forward? But I'm just wondering whether would a tripartite, a tripartite social dialogue, yeah, a formal social dialogue mechanism that brings together the government, the workers associations and the employers um, and this would apply both to domestic workers and to contract workers. A formal tripartite social dialogue mechanism that bring all three parties together to really find solutions, reach solutions um, to protect um, the rights um, of all parties. Yeah, of course, in particular, um, the workers who are most discriminated against. That's one question. Um, the other one in terms of um, for the um, hospital cleaners um, and the whole issue of privatization is sort of you mentioned it um, in one of your recommendations. I'm just wondering whether it is time that advocates and the workers put pressure on the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Labor to set conditions for the concessionaires, concessionaires to grant basic labor rights according to the law and to stop, they need to stop awarding contracts, cleaning concessions 
to those companies that persistently violate basic rights of the workers. That, you know, you know how do we move forward to get redress on this gross exploitation of the most vulnerable group of workers in the country? Thank you. I think that's a really great question. Thank you so much for that, Zaina. Uh, for the first, I, I think for both questions, uh, the underlying uh, denominator that cuts across both is that um, there needs to be a lot of political will. Right? For both uh, the first one, the, the tripartite engagement, and secondly as well, uh, both need a lot of political will and um, you know uh, a really sincere action from our government to do something. Um, I actually think that, uh, Zaina, your uh, proposal earlier today uh, when uh, you uh, engaged with the witness um, and, rec and, and, and suggested for an international pressure instead, you know, international uh, trade unions coming together and, and really putting pressure on our government, it being an international news, then I think that would um, start the engine uh, running um, and, and maybe uh, encourage more politi political will in that sense. Going on to the uh, contractual um, rights uh, of, of the hospital cleaners, um, if I can just uh, go into a little bit more technical, uh, it, a little bit more te technically, um, actually the contract workers, uh, we have to look at the contract. And if their contract says contract for service, there's a difference between contract of service and contract for service, right? So the difference is contract of service, you are deemed an employee. Contract for service, you are deemed an independent contractor and you are not afforded those rights under the Employment Act. You are basically a freelancer. Um, you, you, you are self-employed. So if in fact the contract says that, and I, I'm, I, I'm almost certain maybe 80 to 90% the contract says that, that they are contract for service. I think this is unfortunately a way um, for these employers to circumvent out of the Employment Act and not afford the rights to these hospital workers, you see. Um, that, that I think needs to change and how that can be changed. Unfortunately, we have to turn to the judiciary. Uh, we can say it's illegal. We can say, you know, uh, it's not right. Moral obligation is not there and all that. But until and unless the court of law says that uh, whatever we say, you know, illegal and all that, it still doesn't hold any weight until the court actually decides that it is indeed illegal. And how do we do that? We have to then bring that to, to, to the court. Thank you, Vivian. Vivian. Oh, sorry, we are taking up time. But I don't have a question, but I want to sort of say a couple of, uh, make a couple of comments. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you very thoroughly analyzed the uh, situations of the testimonies that you've looked at, and thank you for that. But there are a couple of points that I want to uh, make. When you looked at international standards, you only mentioned ILO. Um, we have to bring in CEDAW here as an international standards that need to be applied on two grounds. One, the, the principle of equality and non-discrimination of CEDAW is very applicable, which is Article 1, Article 2, and so on. Secondly, Article 11 of CEDAW, the whole elaboration of the human rights standards that need to be applied in employment of women. Uh, so there's a lot of details there which will be very useful for application here, and we need to bring that in. Um, you mentioned, for example, very rightly that the Employment Act uh, does not define discrimination, does not prohibit discrimination, but only sets out a kind of a procedure uh, in case discrimination occurs. Now that is where Article One of CEDA becomes crucial because it defines discrimination as direct discrimination and indirect discrimination. Indirect discrimination imposes certain positive duties on the state but that has to put in place certain measures that will enable um, access to opportunities and fulfill rights. 
um, a very a very simple example is you may not direct against a disabled person uh, directly. You may say you're welcome to come in and work. We welcome you, but you don't put an axis. You don't put in a ramp into the building. The person cannot even come in. And so, not putting in the ramp, but saying giving them formal equality and saying you are welcome to come and work is indirect discrimination. And this so that definition needs to be brought in into everything uh, we do. Um, the second thing I want to point out is um, uh, in terms of domestic work, um, you said, uh, and I appreciate what you said, you said domestic work should not be dangerous. You know, uh, there should be no harm, but there is harm. Uh, for example, when employers make like Adeline clean with cleaning liquids that are very powerful and that creates harm. Uh, so this question of occupational safety of work in the home, uh, working from home, domestic work, how do we bring in that principle? Because occupational safety is recognized in employment, yeah? Uh, yeah. So uh, we need to uh, talk about that. And then one last point that I want to make is, uh, there is a gender ideology that streams women into women's kinds of work domestic work, hospital cleaners, we need to change that ideology and make it open and expand the scope of occupations available on an equal basis, both women and men. So there are a lot of things that we need to additionally bring in into this uh, situation of employment and the economy. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Mary. I think that those are really fantastic uh, recommendations um, and uh, we can actually include that uh, in our amendments to the advocate draft if that would help and then resubmit them to uh, you judges in the coming week. Thank you so much for that. Um, I will now um, yield the floor to my co-advocate Nanari and I will be sharing the slides for her. Thank you Vivian. Good afternoon to all and to the judges who are joining us today. I will be presenting the advocate statements for the following three witnesses. Firstly, Leslie, a sports coach who experienced sexual harassment and workplace abuse. Secondly, Siti Noor, a professional working woman who happens to be a person with disability who experienced discrimination on the basis of gender and her disability. And lastly, Rosia, a single mother who is working as a hospital cleaner who experienced discrimination at the workplace. We will first begin with Leslie. Briefly, from Leslie's testimony, she shared with us that she is a sports coach who experienced harassment mainly by her male colleagues. And in experiencing these harassment, she was subjected to the following kind of discrimination during her term of employment. Firstly, she was exploited. Her abilities were repeatedly belittled. She was positioned in a lower ranking role despite her qualifications, and she was paid lesser than her colleagues who were less qualified than she was. Secondly, she was discriminated wherein she was denied opportunities for advancement and exposure within the sports industry by the sole reason of her being a female sports coach who cannot stay with other coaches. And lastly, in terms of sexual harassment, Leslie was repeatedly and constantly harassed and lured to go to her employer's home under the guise of work purposes and late night phone calls, despite her evident discomfort. She also experienced male colleagues who often made degrading and derogatory comments about women in the sports industry. Bearing this in mind, we will now look at the available laws in Malaysia pertinently as it pertains to sexual harassment at the workplace. Regrettably, 
there is no specific piece of legislation in Malaysia currently that governs or regulates sexual harassment. In early September of this year, we were informed that, a sex, that an anti-sexual harassment bill will be tabled at the parliament. However, looking at existing legislations, there appears to be some semblance of what can constitute sexual harassment being addressed. For instance, if we look at the penal code, the penal code criminalizes the following acts which may amount to sexual harassment. For example, molestation under section 354, assault or use of criminal force with the intent to dishonor a person, outrageous on decency, or word or gesture intended to insult the modesty of any person. Under the penal code, generally, these offenses carry a sentence of imprisonment. However, because these are criminal acts, the standard of proof required is significantly higher and may not necessarily address the forms of sexual harassment that take place in a workplace environment. If we look at the Employment Act 1955, currently the Employment Act addresses the complaint of a sexual harassment rather than acts of sexual harassment. That being said, the provisions in the current Employment Act merely lay out a process and procedure for inquiry in the event there is a complaint of sexual harassment rather than acts of sexual harassment. This appears to be insufficient as it only addresses procedures once a complaint is made rather than addressing sexual harassment being an offense on its own. However, we have recently heard that an amendment to the Employment Act will be tabled. And this proposed amendment includes a notification it compels employers to prepare a notification to raise awareness on sexual harassment. However, this is liberally drafted to include acts such as putting up a poster on what constitutes sexual harassment, merely doing a simple act of raising awareness on there being sexual harassment appears to be sufficient. There is nothing further than that. In terms of the Industrial Relations Act, Section 20 addresses remedies where one is dismissed unfairly or has resigned due to sexual harassment. The remedies include reinstatement to the position and compensation in lieu of the reinstatement. This provision fails to consider the long-term mental impact that a victim of sexual harassment at the workplace may suffer, as seen from Leslie's testimony, where she was only able to seek professional help four years after her tenure at her SIT Academy. Next would be the Code of Practice on the Prevention and Eradication of Sexual Harassment in the Workplace. This code was introduced by the then Ministry of Human Resource in 1999. This code appears to be comprehensive as it even includes provisions for sexual annoyance, where an annoying conduct creates a bothersome working environment where the recipient has to continue working under such conditions. This code, while comprehensive, is merely optional for adoption. It is not compulsory and it has not been updated to reflect the modern changes in a more digitized society. And as stated earlier, we have recently heard that the sexual harassment, anti-sexual harassment bill will be tabled at the parliament. In terms of discrimination in general, we bear in mind um, what our judge had pointed out earlier on the applicable CEDAW principles, which will be reflected in our amended advocate statement. We now look at a fundamental convention of the International Labour Organization, namely Convention 11, Discrimination, Employment and Occupation Convention 1958. This 
Convention at Article 2 provides that a member state must undertake to pursue a national policy to promote national conditions and practice that speak of equality of opportunity and treatment in respect of the employment and occupation with a view of eliminating any form of discrimination. A national policy when implemented of this nature, it will cut across industries, including the sports industry, and it will create or it will compel to create equal opportunities for women employees. It is important that there is correction, rectification and creation of an environment of equal opportunities at the workplace. To this end, we recommend the following. We recommend that the parliament urgently table the anti-sexual harassment bill. We propose that the code of practice and prevention and eradication of sexual harassment be amended and made compulsory. And lastly, for Malaysia to ratify the convention number 11, discrimination 1958, number 111. That will be all for Leslie. Moving on to the next witness, Sitino. Siti Noor is a professional engineer and is a patient with comorbidity, comorbidities stemming from a rare disease. Siti Noor's medical condition impacts her, impacts both her physical and mental health. As the family's breadwinner, Siti Noor requires close follow-ups by a team of medical specialists to ensure that she is able to function effectively at her workplace. These facts were well known to City Nurse employer at the time, including her team members and her colleagues and superiors. Despite the knowledge of City Nurse condition, in late 2020, City Nurse was offered a severance package for failing to meet performance standards, despite her achieving her key performance indicators and pursuing for an annual performance review of her conduct that year. When we speak of non-discrimination, what we mean is non-discrimination does not just mean treating every individual as equal, but not discriminating an individual based on their physical or mental impediment. From City Nurse testimony, it was evident that there was inadequate recognition of the challenges faced by persons with disability in the workplace it appeared that there was little to no protection against discriminations that she faced. And further, despite her requesting for accommodation, there was no understanding of the need or provision of reasonable accommodation that would have enabled her to effectively function in the workplace. And lastly, there was no protection against the sexual harassment that she faced at her workplace. Moving on. This is clearly in contrary to the current laws that we have in place. Malaysia has ratified the Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities in May of 2008. Next slide, please. In doing so, Malaysia acknowledged and made the following declaration. Malaysia acknowledged that the principles of non-discrimination and equality as provided under the CRPD, and it specifically highlighted the specific provisions in respect of discrimination, equality of opportunity, and prohibition of discrimination on the basis of disability, and committed to ensuring full and equal enjoyment of all human rights and fundamental freedoms by persons with disabilities. However, in doing so, Malaysia, Malaysia enacted the Persons with Disabilities Act in 2008, the PWD. However, the PWD has attracted criticism that it is in no way comprehensive nor sufficiently inclusive. A recent review of the PWD Act shows that there has been no mechanism 
for enforcement of the PWD. In respect of the specific issue faced by City Noor, Section 29 of the PWD speaks of a, a, the right of a person with disability in respect of access to employment. It places an obligation on the employer to protect the rights of persons with disabilities on an equal basis and to provide just and favorable conditions of work, including equal opportunities. In Siti Noor's case, she was evidently denied any opportunities for advancement or overseas posting. The provisions in the PWD Act appears to be applicable for City Nurse particular case. She may seek legal redress if she ought to. However, the provisions itself are in insufficient as they fail to address or provide for a remedy in the event the employer fails to abide by the provisions which compel them to provide protection for persons with disabilities. The Employment Act 1955, in 2018, there was a proposal to include disability as a category of non-discrimination at the stages of pre-employment and during employment. However, a year later, the Ministry of Human Resource chose to exclude disability as one of the categories of non-discrimination. And as we discussed earlier, a sexual anti-sexual harassment bill will be tabled by the parliament um, later this year. And Malaysia has yet to ratify Convention 11 on discrimination, particularly Article 5 of this convention provides that any measures that a state undertakes to provide special protections for those with disability, such special measures will not be deemed as discrimination. And to this end, we recommend the following. Firstly, we recommend that Malaysia acts towards urgent harmonization of the PWD Act and its declaration in respect of the CRPD. Secondly, that the Employment Act 1955 is amended to include persons with disability to be free from discrimination. And thirdly, for there to be development of mandatory guidelines which include a complaint mechanism for compliance of section 29 of the PWD to, for Malaysia to sign and ratify the optional protocol to the CRPD. And lastly, to ratify and accede to convention number 11 of the ILO. We now move on to the last witness, Rosia. Rosia is a single mother who is who has been working as a hospital cleaner at the Bukit Murtajam Hospital for the past 10 years. She is also serving as the president of Kasatuan Pekerja Pekerja Prahidmatan Sokongan Swasta, the union. The issues that Rosia faces are as follows. In her capacity as president of the union, Rosia has highlighted that hospital cleaners are often paid low wages which constrains them to seek part-time employment, which takes time from family away. This is especially important as most of these hospital cleaners are single parents who play the parental and provider role in their family structure. As, and as we've heard from previous testimonies, the contract system in the employment of hospital workers provides no stability, which leads to an inability to provide for and plan for the future. And in her capacity as the president of the union, Rosia has personally and continually faced harassment and discrimination by her employers, such as being asked to work at two to three locations in contravention to the limitation that they have to um, abide by. And lastly, she has also highlighted that the mostly women workforce are afraid to raise any issues of discrimination for fear of backlash from their employers. Next. She has also discovered that hospital cleaners are excluded from any increments and additional health ministry allowances despite being on the front lines during this pandemic. And as we've heard repeatedly, due to the privatization policy, hospital cleaners are, are excluded 
from any of these increments or allowances that the health ministry allocates to healthcare workers. In terms of existing laws in Malaysia, we see that the Employment Act for contract workers stipulates and provides for minimum standards to be adhered to. And as highlighted earlier, these minimum standards include rights such as rights to annual leave, sick leave, termination, retirement, and layoff benefits. None of these rights appear to be expressly present or afforded to hospital cleaners who are under, the, who are under contracts by concessionaires. We state that it is important for years of service to be taken into account in the annual renewal of the contract. And the recently proposed amendments to the Employment Act proposes section 69F that provides an inquiry process where there are discrimination at the workplace. Broadly, it's arguable that Rosia's Employers Acts may amount to discrimination but this proposed amendment does not include a definition as to what constitutes discrimination, nor does it provide grounds for what discrimination is. While it is arguable that Rosia's experience may amount to discrimination without clarity, it opens doors for the converse to be argued as well. For this reason, we recommend the following. Firstly, we recommend that the Ministry of Human Resources to review and revise the terms of the privatization policy and as suggested by our judge earlier, to propose a formal tripartite social dialogue between the concessionaires as well as all stakeholders to ensure that they are in line with the current provisions and upcoming amendments of the Employment Act 1955 and for the proposed amendments to, to provide more clarity and recognition to rights and benefits of hospital cleaners. In conclusion, on behalf of Vivian and myself, I would like to thank the seven witnesses and their representatives for their bravery in testifying their stories. These courageous women represent the realities of everyday people that we often pass by. Through their testimony, we have seen that discrimination in economy cuts across women from any background and walk of life be it professional or otherwise. We thank the tribunal and the judges for this opportunity to hear from these brave women and for providing us the opportunity to stand in the gap in advocacy. Thank you for your time and I welcome any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nanari. Now I welcome the judges if you have any questions for Nanari. Thank you, Nanari, for your clear presentation. Appreciate it very much. Thank you, judges. Thank you once again, uh, Nanari. Thank you, judges. We will move on to the following advocate statement. We have today with us uh, the next advocate, Nisha Ayu, who is a transgender activist and the co founder of Seed Malaysia and Justice for Sisters. In 2016, she was awarded the prestigious International Women of Courage Award. Nisha will be presenting her advocate statement on the theme, Gender Identity. I now welcome Nisha. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kusa. Can you hear me? Awesome, thank you. Um, yes. My name, just to repeat again, my name is Nisha Ayu, and I'm a transgender activist and a human, human rights defender working on human rights. Today, I will be providing analysts um, and evidence to support the cases and testimonies presented by two trans women witnesses earlier in the tribunal. Before I start my presentation, um, let me explain briefly, if I may, about what is gender. Gender is most often described based on social constructed roles and culture and would be seen as what is commonly known between your legs, that is the mentality of society. But people need to understand what is between your legs are uh, actually your sexual organs, you know. Um, they don't have brains to tell who you are. So what I'm saying is that your gender identity is actually between your ears, which is your brain. Yeah. And um, gender is diverse. 
it's not binary and it's just not based on the binary constructed patriarchal system. Thank you. So I'm going to share my slide. Just give me a moment. Okay, um, is the slide on? Yes, we can. Awesome. Okay, thank you so much. So, um, first of all, let me talk about the, the issue of transgender in Malaysia itself. Yeah, transgender or trans women uh, are commonly known in Malaysia as Tirunangai. Uh, in Indian and in Malay is known as Manya or in Chinese as Kwa Singlen. Trans and gender diverse people have existed throughout humanity. Historically, gender diverse people exist in many cultures and communities as evidence based by documentation of Hijra and Fapa Fini. And in Malaya and Borneo, known as Sida Sida, Manang Bali, and many more gender diverse identities have been well documented. In Malaysia, before the 80s, trans women are recognized legally. Yes, we are recognized legally, where we are given our rights just like other citizens. Transgender people are integrated in within the society. Transgender women were given their rights to health where they are able to access to hormone therapy and even given free sex reassignment surgery. And not just that, we were also given our rights to personal liberty where we can change our gender marker and name in our ID card. However, since the enforcement of state Sharia laws in Malaysia, starting from the end, uh, 80s onwards, the transgender people have been living in fear of being prosecuted and discriminated based on our gender identity and expression, which I will further elaborate later. In Malaysia, trans women are criminalized based on their gender identity and expression under the State Sharia Enactment and Act in all 13 states and the federal territory. There are two versions of this law. In 10 states, it mentioned any male person in public places where a woman's attire and poses as a woman for immoral purpose should be found guilty as an offense. In other, in, in five states, sorry, in three states, any male person in public places where a woman's attire poses as a woman should be found guilty. And she could be fined or imprisonment or even both. Yeah, and as you're aware, since we're not recognized in the system, trans women will be placed in the male's prison. In the recent Kelantan Sharia Criminal Code, in that month 2019, recently, there came into force punishment against two new anti-trans law that was introduced. Meanwhile, many other laws make trans women vulnerable to discrimination and violence. In recent years, the impact of criminalization can be seen by statements, example, giving out, uh, gave out by our ex-Minister of Islam, giving full license to arrest and educate transgender people. When you say educate, it's about using corrective therapy or corrective approach. Ruling by the Fatwa Council in Paris to ban transgender women to enter the mosque. Religious enforcers in Kelantan 
distributing anti-LGBT pamphlets. In, in public area, and at the same time, they even arrested transgender women in, in the mall itself. Private events of trans women being raided by villages and forces. The criminalization also empowers the state to arrest trans people under laws as evidenced by the most viral case in Malaysia, Sajat, for instance, and other cases. How gender is understood in the international law? Yeah. In the last few years, we have seen many court cases seeking protection and recognition of trans and gender diverse people. Gender-based discrimination is prohibited under international law through various human rights treaties, including CEDAW. CEDAW acknowledges uh, which prohibits all forms of discrimination against women based on the grounds on sex and gender. CEDAW acknowledges sex and gender are two separate things, yet interconnected aspects of our lives. Article 2 of CEDAW requires state parties to modify or to ab abolish existing laws and policies which constitute discrimination against women. Meanwhile, the General Recommendation 28 on the core obligation of state parties under Article 2 of the CEDAW introduced the concept of intersectionality. In Tarani's case, based on a testimony, yeah, Tarani's testimony reveals multiple forms of discrimination, including discrimination at workplace based on her gender identity, where she had restriction from wearing clothes or uniform or even accessories and other items that express her gender identity. She was subjected to bullying and verbal discrimination based on her gender identity. Discrimination against women rights defenders. From Tarani's testimony, it is clear that she is being an openly transgender woman. Defending the right of workers made her vulnerable to discrimination because of her gender identity. Her gender identity and expression became the cause of her harassment, discrimination, and violence because of her activism at the same time. Her experiences of discrimination are compounded by the non-recognition of transgender people and gender diverse person, as well as criminalization of LGBTQ person in Malaysia which render trans women like Tarani being unprotected under the law and vulnerable to discrimination and impunity. The Suhakam reports notes the, the correlation between non-recognition of trans people and employment discrimination, its cascading impact on livelihood of trans people. Based on their findings, Suhakam recommends introduction of comprehensive legislation and or policy on equality and non-discrimination, which especially includes sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, and sex characteristic as grounds of discrimination. Similarly, Suakam also recommends the private sector to adopt inclusive policies on discrimination and bullying at the workplace in line with the United Nations guiding principle on business and human rights. In Tarani's case, while the direct perpetrator could be an employee, her company as an employer has the duty to avoid contributing and mitigate adverse human rights impact. Principle 15 
of the guiding principle recommends business enterprise to put in place appropriate policies and processes in order to meet their responsibility to respect human rights. We recommend the private sector to adopt an anti-discrimination workplace policy in line with the United Nations guiding principle on business and human rights, which also express states so geez, as grounds of discrimination. Lastly, in line principle 17 of the guiding principle, which recommend companies to carry out human rights due to diligence to identify, prevent, to mitigate, and account for actual potential human rights impact. How they will address adverse human rights impacts among others. Now let's go to Paddy's testimony. In Paddy's testimony, highlights several intersecting issues. One was the criminalization and its wide ranging impacts on trans people. Her sharing also shows the haptic cause of seeking access to justice. In Paddy's situation, her desire to be free for criminalization, arbitrary arrest, and detention came at the cost of her own mental health and well being. She also shared the impact of um, the COVID 19 situation where she emphasized that trans and gender diverse people and their experience are not included yeah and therefore they are also not included in many research and data collection processes as a result trans people and gender diverse people are not only left behind but they also remain invisible Sorry. Patty's testimony also highlights issues of family acceptance and isolation, which correlates criminalization and increasing context of anti trans and LGBT sentiments. While in court, Patty also shared the humiliating and degrading treatment that she faced in court when the court official call her name in a legal document, or we, or we say a state name loudly, misgendering and outing her in public place. Her experience in the court correlates with the non-recognition of misinformation regarding trans and gender diverse people. The binary and gender segregation in Sharia court does affect transgender people. The Suwakam study shows 57 respondents share that they experience challenges when dealing with government actors and agencies because of their gender identity and expression. Meanwhile, 65 respondents shared that, it, that they have faced challenges in accessing gendered spaces. In our recommendation, we call the government to review and repeal all discriminative laws and practice such as corrective therapy based on gender identity and gender expression in line with human rights norms and standards. And all prosecution and harassment against transgender and other LGBTQ person based on their gender identity, gender expression and orientation carry out gender, diversity, and human rights training with public officials, such as police and other state officials. Enact a Gender Recognition Act, similar to the Gender Identity, Gender Expression, and Sex Registry Act 2015 in Malta, which recognized trans and gender diverse based on the person's self-determined gender identity meaning no medical intervention is needed for recognition of gender. The Act outlines the registration process, data protection, among others. To take necessary measures in introducing legislation that will allow gender recognition for trans people.
Thank you so much. Thank you, Nisha, for your presentation. I'd like to welcome the judges if you have any questions or comments to Nisha. Thank you very much, Nisha, for that extremely comprehensive um, presentation. We really admire for a long time your courage and your tireless advocacy for the rights of trans people. Um, Nisha, you've shared with us a long list of multiple forms of discrimination, violence, surveillance that trans women in this country are subject to sometimes on a, you know, on a daily basis, right? Your safety to go out as a citizen of this country is threatened and recommendations. If you can prioritize one immediate, immediate change that needs to take place um, to enable trans women to live dignity on a day, what would be that one urgent change that has to take place now? Thank you so much for the question. Um, for me personally, the main or the immediate changes that I would see would assist the transgender community here in Malaysia is legal gender recognition. Yeah, the community need to be legally recognized. Therefore, they will be protected under the system eventually. So once we are recognized legally, eventually it will, it will create a dominant effect. Uh, when it comes to the livelihood of the transgender community, whether it's education, employment, or even when it comes to COVID situation, you know, being, being, being able to access to those social uh, needs and so on. So I would say legal gender recognition would be the first priority for me. Thank you, Nisha. We certainly would our recommendation certainly thank you so much for your for your work for all the work that you're doing and for sharing with us today thank you so much to all judges and thank you much so much to the tribunal tribunal a woman's tribunal for actually including transgender women in the discussion thank you so much thank you thank you zaina and thank you once again nisha moving on the next uh, theme the theme on education will be presented by dr surya anjit who is an assistant professor in the University of Nottingham, Malaysia. I now invite Dr. Surya. All right, just checking if everybody can hear me. Am yes. I clear to everyone? Yes. All right, thank you. Uh, selamat as is. Uh, I'm Surya Selase Anji, a Tamiya Ora Asli from Guam, Nusang, Kelantan. Uh, I completed my PhD in education at the University of Melbourne, Australia, and I specialize in education for Indigenous students. I'm here, to, I'm here today to share the summary of my advocacy statement based on the testimonies or stories given by four young Orang Asli women, uh, Rosita Bintidola, Noraini Elias Chipang, Anak Perempuan Bah Itam, Siti Fida, Anak Perempuan Tan Kotal, and Yaliana Bintilena. Before I proceed to my summary, I'd like to thank all these strong young women for sharing their stories, which are very close to my heart as well. Moving on to my summary, I'd like to begin with some brief information about the Orang Asli of Malaysia. According to the Department of Orang Asli Development 2018, the Orang Asli communities make up 0.55% of the country's population. Most people mistakenly think that we are from the same group, uh, but we actually come from 18 different subgroups. Allow me to read all the names of these subgroups here because I strongly believe that all of us deserve to be mentioned here today. We deserve to be mentioned here because most of us are either unknown or even forgotten. Hi, Dr. Surya, uh, I'm very sorry to uh, interrupt. I'd like to request for you to go a little bit slower to allow oh. the interpreters to, yes, to catch up. Okay. Thank yeah. you so much, Dr. Surya. All right, thank you. Sorry, sorry about that. Okay. Um, the Orang Asli of Malaysia come from these groups, these 18 groups known as the Semai, the Termia, Semotberi, Jahud, Mahmari, Orang Kuala, Orang Kana, Orang Seletar, Jakun, Semelai, Temuan, Kensu, Kinta, Lano, Jahai, Chekwong, and Mandrik. Uh, and one more is Batik. 
As widely documented in the literature, these 18 groups of orang asli to varying degrees have suffered a history of oppression and marginalization. Today, orang asli are struggling with numerous socioeconomic issues related to the lack of land rights, poverty and education. In line with the scope of this session today, my statement will mostly focus on educational issues. In school, Aura Asli students face two major struggles, which are high dropout rates and low level of academic attainment. According to the Ministry of Education, in 2017, the dropout rate for Aura Asli students was 26%. For comparison, the dropout rate for the national average in 2017 was only 3.4 percent. The achievement of Ora Asli schools is also much lower compared to the national average. Let's take for example, as reported by the Ministry of Education in 2017, the passing rate of Ora Asli primary schools was only 20.2 percent compared to the national average of 68.1 percent. In the literature, Various economic, geographic, and cultural factors have been cited as the obstacles that are hindering Oran Asli students from getting access to quality education. Another reason is also the use of a national curriculum that does not meet the needs of Oran Asli students. Statements given by the four witnesses provide deeper insights into the actual lived experiences of Orang Asli students in the formal educational setting, which may also help to explain why we are facing the earlier mentioned educational issues in Orang Asli schools. In their statements, witnesses recall their excitement being in school where they talked about being a star athlete, reading storybooks in the library, and even making new friends at school. However, these heartwarming stories are tainted by words and comments such as bully, EJ, Hina, hey, orang asli, kamu bodoh, saya tidak mampu, and comments like saya hilang minat, which overall generally capture their struggles in schools. In these statements, bullying is a struggle that most witnesses have highlighted. Prior research, as well as the media, have also reported numerous incidences of bullying in, in these Orang Asli, um, Orang Asli children's schooling experiences. Apart from the bullying incidences, these four girls also shared some similar experiences growing up in school hostels away from their families. This is common for Orang Asli children. In fact, some Orang Asli children have to leave home at the age of seven to stay in school hostels as, the, as their homes are too far from the local schools. This means that for many Orang Asli girls or many Orang Asli children, they grow up in schools with their teachers being their guardians. This is probably why in all statements, one common main character mentioned by all witnesses is the teacher or cikgu. In my previous studies with Orang Asli girls and mothers, the importance of teachers' roles was constantly highlighted in every conversation we had about Orang Asli children's schooling experiences. Apart from these negative experiences, I would also like to highlight the excitement and the enthusiasm that the witnesses had during their schooling years. This is in contrast to what has been claimed by, by many people in previous studies that Orang Asli students are not motivated or interested in education. In all statements given by our witnesses, they were clearly excited about going to school. In my work with the Orang Asli communities, I also found the same enthusiasm among Orang Asli children. They too want to do well in school and achieve great things. Orang Asli mothers whom I have spoken to also have high hopes for their children to succeed in school, despite some mothers not being literate themselves. However, they are also worried about the school environment that is not always supportive or of their home cultures and beliefs, as we can see in the statements shared by the witnesses. Now, what might happen to Orang Asli children who have to endure these struggles? 
um, some might drop out of school, like in the cases of our witnesses, some might end up getting married despite their young age. Many girls, regardless whether they survive schooling or not, will struggle with low self-esteem or lack of self-worth. Some young Orasli women manage to go to universities, earn degrees, but struggle to get employed because they are not confident enough to compete with other graduates. Unemployment amongst Orang Asli graduates is an issue that warrants our attention because the young Orang Asli girls and boys alike might start to develop this belief that they don't need to pursue education because their older siblings are unemployed even after completing three or four years of tertiary education. Personally, to some extent, I can relate to the experiences shared by these four young women. I understand how challenging schooling was for them and for many other Orang Asli children. As a young girl, I was told not to speak Termia, my mother tongue Termia, so that people wouldn't know that I was a Termia, an Orang Asli. I learned English because I was told that it was a language of power, a language that would amplify my voice. In my early school years, I was bullied because of my Orang Asliness. So I decided to put my in indigenous identity aside while hidden from my peers. When my Orang Asli identity was hidden, I experienced less hostility and less bullying. I was more or less given an equal opportunity to learn and flourish. But the question is, is fitting in or in some extreme cases, assimilating into the wider community, the solution to this issue of bullying, which stems from the stigmatization of Orang Asli identities, beliefs and cultures. In my opinion, definitely not. This is not the solution that we, we are looking for. Why do we have to leave our Orang Asliness at home or at the school gates just to pursue education? Why can't we celebrate our beautiful identities and cultures and be proud of them while also learning more about ourselves and the world at the same time? Why can't we have both? So now, what can we do to make our Asli children feel safer and eventually flourish in schools? At the moment, various initiatives such as the comprehensive special model schools known as K-9 schools, contextualized curriculum Asli and Penan, and also the establishment of a research center to develop curriculum and pedagogy for Oran Asli and min other minority groups have already been introduced by the government. But looking at the current statistics, we know that more needs to be done. To further strengthen the existing initiatives, I would like to put forward three recommendations which are informed by previous studies and existing policies. In the interest of time, I will not go into the details, but I hope these recommendations will lead to even more constructive conversations about Orang Asi women's and children's right to education in the future. I would like to begin with the most important element yet the one that we like the most, trust. We need to first of all build mutual trust. This mutual trust can only be formed if both parties, the Orangasi communities and the non-Orangasi communities know each other better. To achieve this, the role of teachers is fundamental. Here, it should be highlighted that in preparing or training our teachers, and other stakeholders to work with Oran Asi students, the delicate issues of power imbalance, racial prejudices, and internalized biases need to be addressed in a constructive manner. Secondly, elements of indigenous curriculum and indigenous pedagogy should be strategically integrated into the existing system used in Oran Asi classrooms. Apart from that, we should also establish more community schools or community learning centers where government and non-government agencies alike can partner with local communities by providing training to the community, particularly the mothers. An existing community learning center run by a group of teachers led by a term one teacher, Ms. Janita Engi in Kampung Tual in Pahang can actually be a case study for this initiative. 
To sum up, I would like to reiterate that for all the earlier mentioned recommendations to actually work, it is important for us to address other unaddressed issues related to land rights recognition of Ora Asli, conservation of Ora Asli resources, Ora Asli identities, healthcare, leadership, and also documentation. In any planning and decision making concerning Ora Asli communities, two key principles outlined in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which are right to free, prior, and informed consent and the right to self-determination should be incorporated as the guiding principles. That's all from me today. Thank you for listening. And if the judges have any questions, I'll do my best to address them now. And I will certainly welcome any recommendations from the judges as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Surya, for your statement. Uh, judges, do you have any questions for Dr. Surya? Uh, Dr. Surya, let me thank you very much for your presentation, your analysis of the issues uh, and the recommendations are extremely well thought out and very strategic. I particularly appreciate what you said about building trust. I think that is a fundamental basis of everything that needs to be done for the Oran Asli community and the free and informed consent for anything with that involved, with the involvement with Oran Asli, for any kind of change, improvement or progress that is planned for them. And I think that is another very important and strategic recommendation that you have made. Thank you so much for coming here and presenting this to us and to a larger audience. Lots of people are listening. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Surya. Thank you again, Shanti. Uh, we will now have a short break. We will come back uh, with four more advocate statements, uh, please come back at 4.10 p.m. Thank you. Kita akan berehat sebentar. Uh, kita akan kembali ke sini pada pukul 4.10 minit petang. Terima kasih. It's something that needs to be done, right? If, how is it okay to violate a woman, a woman like that? And already violated, then she's scared, right? right? Then she just has to be. And the reason she's scared is because society makes sure to shun her because she was violated, because she allowed herself, which isn't true. She never did. You have probably heard of it by now, the horror story that is the V2K Telegram group, home to over 30,000 people who use it to share pictures and videos of Malaysian women without their consent. WA students have been giving a sobering lesson on the legal dangers of sharing explicit images online. According to Sis, who interviewed some of those women, there are over 35,000 members in the chat group. Uh, they reside in Malaysia. And so MCMC said that they've reached out to Telegram in June this year for further assessment and action. They are also working closely with the Malaysian police to investigate further and have asked Interpol for assistance. So I had a boyfriend uh, and we, we had a really good time together and he had issues, I had issues, uh, we ended things because like after he went back to the UK and I mean, things just weren't working out, right? So um, as a, a relationship that wouldn't work, like another thing, that thing that's end and you go your way and I go my way and it's good. A few months down the line, uh, I get a a message on I can't remember if it was WhatsApp or, or Facebook Messenger or something. Um, asking, sending me a link and asking me, is this you? And it's a video of me taking a shower. Right? And it's on a porn website. So, and I know, I know um, at that hotel where this video was taken, although I did not know there was a video being taken. I knew, I knew this hotel, I remembered um, the space. So I knew it had to be when I was a kid, right? And 
like of course I don't have it aside for it like because I saw it would be my name and it used to be like Facebook or Instagram or whatever you know you google the name that comes out this time it's all porn and it's often showering if it's an evening every, a thing that everyone does every morning or every night like I just uh, so so anyway like so when this guy sent me this link I denied it I denied that it was me right but he's like it's your name it does look like you I'm like no it's it, it's not me right and um but he's like okay that's good because if it was you it would suck and I'm like how how like I did not give my consent although he does not know this right because he thinks it's not me but I never gave my consent for this video to be taken I never gave my consent for this video to be uploaded I never gave my consent for my full name to be posted on home website and all I was doing was taking a shower how does that make me into a slut? Right. but in society's eyes, I let why is that?
Hello, welcome back everybody. Earlier just now, we just heard four advocates' statements on the themes, constitutional and legal framework, economy, gender identity, and on education. We will now resume with the next advocate. I would like to invite Mr. Yu Ren Chung, the Deputy Executive Director of Women's Aid Organization, who will be presenting his advocate statement on the theme, Violence Against Women. I now welcome Mr. Yu Ren Chung. Thank you. Violence against women is a grievous form of gender discrimination. In this tribunal, nine testimonies were shared recounting accounts of violence against women. And in this statement, I briefly summarize those nine testimonies. Then I present seven insights illustrated by the testimonies. And lastly, I present three recommendations to the government on how to better improve our response to violence against women. So the key points from the nine testimonies. Alia shared her experience of domestic violence that she experienced in 2017. This included physical violence as well as threats. She managed to divorce her husband um, and the court granted her maintenance, but her ex-husband only pays about a fifth of his obligations currently. Indira Gandhi experienced domestic violence by her then husband. In 20, uh, 2005, he used her name to buy a car and then defaulted on the loan. This affected Indira's credit record. He later assaulted Indira and her family members and unilaterally converted their children to Islam before he sought custody of the children in the Sharia court. Next, Sophia shared her experience of being stopped for over two years, beginning in 2019. She was stopped by a former partner. The stalker repeatedly contacted her, sometimes more than 100 times a day, through calls, messages, and emails. He tracked her, choked her, and harassed her through her family and her friends. As a result of this stalking, Sophia is perpetually in fear. Next, Siti Noor, an engineer, experienced sexual harassment at work between 2018 and 2020. She experienced misogynistic and sexual comments that were regularly made in the company's um, WhatsApp group. Her supervisor made comments about her marital status and she was treated unfairly on the basis of her gender. These experiences negatively affected her mental as well as physical health. Next, Leslie, a, a sports coach, was sexually harassed at work. She worked in a company between 2016 and 2017, where her supervisor repeatedly called her at night, asking her to go to his house and to sleep over. He harassed her family and friends. This made Leslie feel forced to resign. Leslie also freelanced between 2016 and 2019, and she experienced male colleagues regularly making sexual and derogatory comments about women. Leslie was repeatedly asked about her relationship status by married colleagues. Next, Alia Effendi experienced gender-based cyber harassment. Last year, 
Alia gave a speech at a public assembly. And without her consent, someone recorded a video of her and shared it online. Her private information was shared, messages targeting her physical appearance, and images depicting violence against her were sent to her and posted online. This made Alia withdraw completely from online spaces for a long period of time. Shakila Zen is an activist and social media professional. She received numerous comments and messages in the course of her work that were threatening and demeaning, targeting her gender. This year, Shakila made a video about environmental activism and democracy. And following this video, she was sent a replica human hand, which was painted in red, and also received an acid attack threat. This made her feel depressed and terrified. Adelina Lisao was an Indonesian domestic worker who was abused and eventually murdered by her employer. Putri Noaina Balkis compiled stories from girls of harassment and abuse that they experience in schools through an Instagram page. In total, there were more than 500 stories that were received and published on the page, including a girl who was stalked to her house by a male classmate, a girl who was groomed by an ustaza, and many accounts of period spot checks. These stories show that reports by girls are regularly dismissed. They show that victims receive backlash and schools are not respectful of girls. So those were the nine testimonies that were shared um, that related to violence against women in Malaysia. And they really illustrate for us what violence against women looks like in this country. From that, I want to highlight seven insights from those testimonies. The first insight is that testimonies, the testimonies identify the different forms of gender-based violence in Malaysia. It includes domestic violence, stalking, sexual harassment, gender-based harassment, assault, child grooming, and even murder. And these experiences are not isolated. Recent studies on Malaysia done in the past two years have estimated that the prevalence rate for intimate partner violence against women ranges between five and 36%, depending on the context. Study shows that 39% of women in Malaysia have experienced stalking, which caused them fear. 36% of women in Malaysia have experienced sexual harassment, either in the workplace, schools, universities, public spaces, public transport, or other contexts. And a recent study showed that 44% of women had witnessed the teacher make a sexual comment. And again, these are all stories in Malaysia done in the past two years. The second insight that the testimonies show is that they describe the acts associated with each form of violence. Domestic violence can include physical as well as non-physical acts. They can happen during a relationship, but can continue after the relationship has already ended. We see that stalking includes a series of acts, a course of conduct, which includes being repeatedly followed or contacted or harassed. We see that sexual harassment includes receiving unwanted advances or inappropriate comments, or being put in a hostile, misogynistic, or sexist environment. 
we see cyber harassment. And that includes being contacted or mentioned online with degrading and threatening messages. And this could be done by one person or many persons targeting you. The third insight that the testimonies show is that women experiencing gender-based violence often face multiple fo forms of violence and discrimination simultaneously. So we see a woman who experiences domestic violence may face other forms of discrimination, which make it harder for her to leave the abuse or which may be used as part of the abuse against her. We see that stalking can escalate to assault or worse. A woman being sexually harassed may face discrimination as well. And this discrimination might be used as a punishment for her or as coercion to get her to agree to sexual advances. A girl student is at risk of experiencing harassment, stalking, abuse, and other forms of violations at school. The fourth insight we've gained from the testimonies is that violence against women has severe negative impacts on women. It can cause physical harm and make survivors feel fearful and distressed. And in the worst cases, violence against women can lead to murder. Survivors may ideate or even attempt suicide and survivors may lose focus on work and education. Dealing with violence, taking safety precautions, taking legal action and other steps to avoid violence or deal with violence is extremely draining and time consuming. Survivors, for example, may be forced to leave employment or even move homes to stay safe. Violence against women can limit a survivor's access to a family. And survivors may be forced to withdraw socially, physically, and online, and may be discouraged from public and political activities. These are just some of the negative impacts that we've seen happen to the nine women who've shared their testimonies. And violence against women in aggregate also results in negative societal outcomes in addition to individual impact, lost productivity, social service costs, and overall reduced well-being of society. The fifth insight gained from the testimonies is that violence against women occurs in all spheres of life. A woman or girl is at risk of violence at home, in school, at work, online, and just in public spaces. Six, we see that power and control are inseparable from violence against women. We see in the testimonies, violence used to enforce power, used as a means to access women's finances, for example, to coerce a woman to agree to sexual advances, and even to silence women with opposing or threatening political views. But we also see power sought through violence as an end. We saw examples of men committing violence to maintain power over women or of women in general. And seventh, and lastly, the testimonies show that violence against women is abetted by gaps in the laws, weaknesses in law enforcement, as well as patriarchal public attitudes. Some examples of these, stalking is not yet a crime. So protection for stalking survivors is limited. We saw the stalking, uh, we saw the example where the survivor had gone to the police but were unable to get adequate support. We also saw that sexual harassment requirements in employment laws are weak, which enabled sexual harassment to happen in two cases. Additionally, for sexual harassment, a survey found that of those who experienced sexual harassment in Malaysia, only 24% of those experiences happened at the workplace. The remaining cases happened at schools, universities, public transport, shopping malls, and other places. And in these places, there were no laws on sexual harassment. So we need to take a broader approach beyond the employment context when we look at sexual harassment. We saw, for example, 
weak enforcement of court orders, including on maintenance and access to children, which denied women from their rights even after leaving an abusive marriage. We saw this in the Indira Gandhi uh, example. Unfortunately, we also saw that the legal framework on domestic violence safety is completely or almost non-existent. And this led to an environment where a woman was actually killed. We saw that schools are not safe place, places for girls. We also saw in the testimonies, several individuals who sought authorities, thought help, sought help from authorities unsuccessfully. And, in the, and in worse, some faced victim blaming responses. Unsupportive employers, schools, and communities further victimize women and girls and prevent them from getting help. And these are not isolated incidences. A recent survey showed that public attitudes in Malaysia remain patriarchal. Only, with only, for example, half of Malaysians opposing violence-endorsing attitudes. So these are just seven insights that we've gleaned from the testimonies given. And now we go on to recommendations. And here I want to focus on the government. And the reason is that only government has the resources needed to effectively address violence against women, but also only, only government has the legitimacy to enforce laws that are sometimes needed to stop violence. So I suggest here three overarching recommendations to the government. First, the government must adequately fund services to respond to violence against women. The government budget generally has not prioritized violence against women response. The two recent federal budgets positively include some funding for violence against women. For example, additional funding for shelter space, short-term contract social workers, and additional funds for the police unit, D11, that handles violence against women cases. So we saw some inclusion, which is positive. However, the gaps that we're talking about, the gaps in resources and, and, and needs remain very striking. For example, we must address a tenfold shortage in domestic violence shelter space in Malaysia. We have to address a threefold shortage of social workers in the country. And there are large disparities of quality, for example, between one sub crisis centers, depending on which hospital they're located in. And these are just examples. So while the recent budget allocations are noteworthy, they must be monitored and scaled up significantly. And in addition to this, NGOs working on gender responsive budgeting have recommended specific funds for one-stop crisis centers in public hospitals. NGOs have recommended a sustainable increase in social workers, so not just short-term contract social workers. Increase funds for training and management standards for frontline responders. So this includes funds for training police officers, welfare officers, medical officers, and others. And NGOs have also recommended to set up a crisis fund for services like government and NGO hotlines that, that, increase, that in, increase in need during emergencies. So that's the first recommendation on budgeting. The second recommendation is that the government must improve laws and policies related to violence against women. There are existing policies and institutions to address violence against women. Nonetheless, as the testimonies showed, there are many gaps in the policy framework. There are some reforms that have been pending and in the works, and the government should pass these without delay. First, a sexual harassment bill that does three things. Define sexual harassment, sets out duties for any organization, be it employer, university, public transport operator, and so on. And thirdly, establishes an oversight mechanism to monitor and receive complaints. This could be a tribunal, for example. Second, stop, make stalking an offense and enable, uh, create protection orders to protect stalking survivors. And third, pass the social workers profession bill. These are things that have been in the works and should not be delayed any further. In addition, the government should introduce specific laws and policies to ensure domestic workers' safety, adopt a violence against women data strategy, 
ensure the National Committee on Responding to Domestic Violence publishes an annual report on its activities and the status of domestic violence in the country. The government should update interagency domestic, domestic violence guidelines, but also create guidelines on domestic violence and violence against women for key institutions that do not have guidelines yet. For example, clinic kesihatan, primary healthcare clinics, and schools. The government should prohibit period spot checks in schools in any form, be it by teacher, student, or anyone else. The Domestic Violence Act should be extended to include non-married intimate partners. And we should delete the exception in the rape offence that exempts husbands from the offence. These are just some examples. The government overall must have an overarching framework to review and monitor policies on violence against women, and this should follow the CEDAW framework. In fact, in the CEDAW report, including observations to Malaysia, the committee has made a lot of the similar recommendations that I'm making here today. And the third and last recommendation to the government is that the government should take steps to improve public attitudes on violence against women. Following COVID-19 and the lockdowns, there has been an increase in, aware in awareness initiatives on violence against women. We've seen, for example, mass SMSs sent through the uh, National Security Council system. We've seen media announcements by government agencies on domestic violence. And we've seen social media posts and campaigns by government agencies and others on violence against women. But there is no strategic and evidence-based effort to change attitudes on violence against women. And this either by the government or even other entities. So towards this end, the government should do a few things. First, collect and analyze population level data on prevalence and attitudes on violence against women every three years. So data on reports themselves are not sufficient. Second, the government should evaluate and improve on existing training modules for enforcement agencies. And these modules should include attitudes of enforcement agencies. And thirdly, the government should design and implement evidence-based public messaging campaigns to improve public attitudes. We've heard nine testimonies that highlight the situation of violence against women in Malaysia. They show us many insights. In all spheres of life, a woman is at risk of violence. They show us that our public, public policy, our public policy framework remains inadequate and that societal attitudes from the public, from communities, as well as responders enable violence against women. I've highlighted three broad steps that the government in particular must take towards ending violence against women in Malaysia. If we do not end violence against women, women will continue to be barred from living a full life on equal terms with men. And that is why we must end violence against women. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ren Chung. I now like to invite uh, judges. Do you have any questions for Ren Chung? Uh, um, Ren Chung, thank you for being with us. And I'm very happy to see you here with us because I know and appreciate your lifetime work, literally, that you do on uh, women's human rights generally and on violence against women in particular, and it's greatly appreciated. You've spoken with much knowledge and understanding of the phenomena of violence against women, and thank you for that. As I was listening, I was thinking there is one other um, area of improvement where the government is concerned that they can bring in, and I'm sorry if I missed it, you may have said it, but let me say what I have observed. One of the issues you raised was lack of police enforcement of whatever laws or regulations. Use the term, there's a patriarchal attitude about the whole matter, which goes against women, which doesn't appreciate women's right to equality. In that sense, uh, if you look at the witness statements, Alia, Shakila Zen, when they were faced with harassment and online violence, they did make go to the police with the problem. 
And if you look at Alia in particular, she was a political activist. And the police took a stand that um, you brought it on yourself kind of syndrome. You went and, and uh, raised these political issues against the leaders of the country. What are you doing? Now that she was a young woman and a woman and she should know her place. It's not for her to be a political activist. I see that uh, was the police attitude. They never took action, even Shakila sense. So my question to you then would be in the three excellent recommendations you have given, what would you say to changing these police attitudes or patriarchal attitudes towards women? Is there a, a recommendation to put in there? I want your... Yeah. Uh, thank you, Shanti. I think um, uh, there are a few la uh, layers to that. So the first is uh, training modules themselves. So, so um, not only the D11 unit must be trained to, uh, with gender sensitization, but the whole police force, frontliners, must receive some kind of training as well. So that's, that's the first point, I think. But I think larger than that, uh, we're talking about societal attitudes. Uh, after all, frontliners make up society and, 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 and their uh, attitudes and behaviors uh, will reflect uh, at some level the society that they live in. And, and that is why I think one area of public policy that, that we have lacked in Malaysia uh, is uh, um, uh, uh, a focus on public attitudes and uh, getting a baseline, monitoring trends, but also implementing evidence-based campaigns uh, and projects um, uh, and messaging that can combat these attitudes at a societal level. Um, uh, so I think those, there, there are two things, you know, first looking at the frontline response itself, but also importantly, looking at societal attitudes um, uh, broadly. Thinking, of, yeah, you're right about what you're saying, absolutely. But also is the police attitude of that they have a responsibility to take action and not to be patriarchal about it. Looking at women to say, you deserve this. You know, what kind of training do you think that will require? Just the police attitude. Yeah. So I think there are two levels again to that. The first is uh, uh, we know that the D11 unit, which is the unit that specializes in violence against women, they do receive specialized training every year. Uh, so, so that is one point, and 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 the issue is that I feel is that uh, uh, it needs to be scaled up. So, so uh, you know, it cannot just be for uh, forty to fifty officers a year. Uh, there are more officers in D eleven for that. And the second, I think, which is perhaps missing at this moment, is uh, training for any frontline officer. So, the officers who responded to the cases that we heard just now, um, perhaps they were not from D eleven. So, so that you know, they're, they're an officer who deals with you know crimes in general. These officers, uh, uh, you know, from my understanding, uh, do not receive the same level of training that D11 does in terms of gender gender sensitization uh, and and responding to violence against women. So that is something that I think uh, is missing that needs to be looked into a bit more. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you very much for being with us and sharing your insights, your knowledge and uh, the wonderful uh, recommendations you've already made. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shanti, and thank you, Renchum. We will move on to the next advocate statement. We are very happy to introduce to you uh, Sharina Muhammad Sharif from Sisters in Islam, who will be presenting her advocate statement on the theme family. Over to you, Sharina. I'm just uh, sharing my um, presentation right now. Um, thank you, Grizel. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Sharina uh, from Sisters in Islam. And today I will be considering um, Okay, sorry, I'm just having some issues with sharing. I don't know why Zoom is giving me some problems, but never mind. I'll go ahead without the PowerPoint. Uh, I will be considering five witness statements today 
three on family issues taken to Sharia court and Mahkamah Anak Negeri Sabah, and two related to citizenship of children born abroad to Malaysian mothers with foreign fathers. Uh, the first is the case of Kwan Nora, divorced after eight years of marriage, conducted through the pronouncement of the Tala by her husband in Sharia court. Uh, the husband had threatened her that he would grant divorce only on condition that she does not claim for matrimonial property or harta sepencarian and child maintenance or nafkah anak. If not, he would seek custody of the children and afraid of losing her children, she agreed. She has since found out that her husband intends to remarry with a substantial sum given as dowry to the intended wife. Uh, and uh, on, the, on the reverse side, Puan Nora receives between uh, RM 800 ringgit uh, during marriage and currently between 600 to 700 ringgit after the divorce for her three young children. Uh, she is still in the process of claiming her rights. Puan Nora's accounts reveal the unlevel power relations that are evident in many situations of marital breakdown and the significant barriers women face in claiming their rights. The issues are, uh, one, women are not aware of their rights in divorce, and this makes them vulnerable to threats and intimidation from the husband. Two, Women do not have the financial capacity to afford a protracted court case. Legal fees can accumulate very fast and legal aid is limited. It is often the case that the husband is in a much stronger financial position. This inequality and unlevel playing field acts as a serious barrier to access rights and justice accorded to women by law. Women also feel that under Islamic laws, men have the sole right to divorce. The wife feels she needs to give in or conform in order to be granted a divorce. And lastly, a serious concern affecting too many single mothers is that maintenance for children is often not provided or insufficiently provided. In many cases, it is not because the ex-husband cannot afford it, but that they are simply irresponsible with their duties towards their children. Enforcement of maintenance orders is weak. It requires a new legal proceeding, incurring yet further costs. So many mothers give up their rights to maintenance as they are unable to spare the time, the money, um, and, and just the effort towards this end. Under Islamic laws, uh, Islamic family laws, women are accorded a range of rights, such as rights to maintenance uh, for herself and for her children, rights to matrimonial property, and rights to accommodation, uh, which, can, which she can claim, notwithstanding her previous agreement with her husband. It is unfortunate that many women still do not access their rights for reasons I have given. We have to bear in mind the reality that a woman who is in a marital breakdown situation is usually overwhelmed with rebuilding her life for herself and for her children. Even if she is aware of her rights with limited finances, she needs to make the hard decision of pursuing her rights or providing for her children. Telenisa statistics, Telenisa is a helpline uh, offered by Sisters in Islam. Uh, Telenisa statistics year after year identify child maintenance arrears or nafka ana as one of the main issues faced. In 2018, 52% of the cases were on children's maintenance. Um, and in 2019, uh, the figure was 42%, so it's uh, consistently a high percentage. Many women have to start extra jobs to maintain themselves and their children, and this can lead them spending less time with their children, less monitoring and parenting time. We hear of many cases of children falling into unhealthy behaviour 
after marital breakdown. So the impact of financial hardship on single mothers cuts across generations. Non-payment of maintenance also relates to poverty of single mother households. While there is no data, uh, national data to show this, the recent report by UNICEF and UNFPA entitled Families Living on the Edge, part two of October 2020, shows that households headed by women are much more vulnerable to economic shocks, such as that faced during this pandemic, such as higher unemployment, no savings, and no EPF or SOXO as buffers, and severe inability to purchase food and pay bills. CEDAW's general recommendation on Article 16 on economic consequences of marriage, family relations, and their dissolution of February 2013 states that men usually experience smaller, if not minimal, income loss after divorce, whilst many women experience a substantial decline in household income and increased dependence on social welfare. Women's economic inferiority permeates all stages of family relationships, often owing to their responsibility for dependence. Courts and relevant authorities should then, as part of the recommendations, courts and relevant authorities should provide... Uh, Sharina, very sorry to interrupt you, but I think uh, there is some interruption with the sound. Uh, maybe it's the shuffling of the notes on the microphone? Uh, I'm not shuffling any notes. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry about that. I think there is some uh, noise interruption from other space, but it's all right, uh, please continue. Thank you, Sherina. Okay, um, so um, yeah, I was saying that uh, the courts and relevant uh, authorities should provide access to clear layman language information so wives are fully aware of their rights. Uh, and in some jurisdictions, such as in the US, uh, they have help centers to support women in their court process. Mediation is another avenue that should be explored and institutionalized. The court needs to understand the lived realities of women and their precarious relationship with the law and from there develop interventions to allow women full and substantive access to the justice system. Maintenance of children is an area which requires immediate attention. This is prevalent in all court systems, Sharia, civil, and the native courts. Initiatives by other jurisdictions are available as precedents, such as to establish a national level agency, which ensures maintenance is mandatorily paid. In the meantime, uh, there are powers available to the courts, such as taking security of assets, salary, or EPF monies for maintenance. The, these powers should be used more widely and strictly on errant fathers. We move now to the cases of Alia and Kolon, uh, which involve similar issues taken at the Mahkamah Anak Negeri Sabah. Alia's husband married another woman and only pays about 20% of the sum in the children's maintenance order. Kolon was abandoned by her husband she is unable to get a divorce as the court requires her to locate her husband and that divorce cannot be granted uh, unless he is present um, and, and, and she cannot locate him. Both cases uh, are ongoing. So over and above the issues which I have spoken of before in terms of awareness and uh, responsiveness of courts to the issues faced by women, uh, witness testimonies such as above also show that gender discrimination and biasness is an issue for these courts. This is an issue for Sharia and civil courts too. Uh, and it extends to other issues such as domestic violence and sexual crimes as well. We recommend that the government give attention to the systemic gender bias in the laws, in the courts, in all its institutions, systems, 
practices and the individuals in them, which prevents just resolutions. Gender sensitization is necessary for all within the legal system to embrace and embody. The judges, for example, the judges in the native courts are almost always men and are usually bound by a stereotype mentality where men are valued above women. These judges are also not always trained in law, thus tend to act in a more conciliatory manner, whereas stronger enforcement may be required. Customary laws are also fluid, a combination of written law and customs, and this gives rise to the lack of clarity and certainty of rights and of outcomes. I move on to a, another, a different issue. Uh, we heard from two witnesses on their struggles with obtaining Malaysian citizenship. Uh, Priscilla was married to a foreign citizen and is a mother of two children born overseas. Since 2015, she has been applying to the Minister of Home Affairs for her children to be granted Malaysian citizenship without success. Her daughters were initially on uh, tourist visas, which means they have to exit the country every 90 days. They are now under a student visa, which requires annual renewal. Uh, the very difficult situation of Jennifer, we heard as well, who is a daughter of a Mal Malaysian mother and foreign father. She is in Malaysia uh, on a student visa on by, because she cannot uh, obtain a Malaysian citizenship. And we heard the difficulties that she uh, is continuously going through. These arrangements, these student visas and um, tourist visas, etc., these arrangements lead to very high costs of Maintaining, maintaining their legal presence in this country. Article 14 of the Federal Constitution of Malaysia grants Malaysian men the right to confer citizenship by operation of law on their children born overseas to a foreign spouse. Malaysian mothers do not have the same rights. They have to make an application. It doesn't happen by operation of law. They have to make an application. And this process is often fraught with inconsistencies, delays, and no guarantee of citizenship. Some applications take more than five years merely to get a response. And usually, a rejection is given without reason. Malaysia is one of only 25 countries in the world that denies women the right to confer nationality uh, on their children on an equal basis as men. And between 2013 and 2018, the approval rate from the Minister of Home Affairs, the approval rate for citizenship was only at 1.64%. Discriminatory nationality laws are explicitly prohibited in Article 9 of CEDAW and has its roots in an understanding of women's status as inferior and women's legal identity as derivative based on the nationality of her father or spouse. It is an expression of the state's position that the father plays a more significant role in the legal identity of the children. Unequal nationality leads to other human rights abuses, such as domestic violence, as we heard from Jennifer, trafficking of women, discrimination in political and public life, particularly the right to vote, discrimination in employment, access to forms of financial credit, such as loans, and so on. The Association of Family Support and Welfare Slango and KL, uh, or better known as Family Frontiers, along with six affected Malaysian mothers, filed a case at the Kuala Lumpur High Court on this matter. The High Court ruled in September 2021 that the word father must be read to include mothers and that their children are entitled to citizenship by operation of law. This was indeed a great victory towards equality in nationality laws. However, the case is currently on appeal from the government. So we shall have to see what the decision of the court is uh, in the appeal. We call on the government to table a constitutional amendment 
to grant Malaysian women equal rights to confer citizenship on their overseas born children. And in the interim, temporary special measures should be established for immediate relief to the children that are affected. We ask for the government to respect the dignity of women and accord substantive equality in their rights within the family. Before I end, I would like to thank the witnesses for their brave contributions. We hope their courage will contribute to a better future for women in this country. Thank you, and thank you to the tribunal. Thank you so much, Sherry, for your statement. I now invite our panel of judges if you have any questions to Sherina. Thank you very much, Sherry, for that um, you know, very comprehensive presentation. You know, to, um, it's really, you know, given the um, discrimination against women in the family, be it in the substance of the law, the structure of the law, the culture of the law, it's really no wonder why a country like Malaysia, which is an upper middle income country, lies at the bottom half and sometimes the bottom 25 countries in many international um, gender um, scales. Yeah, it's, it's really just And basically research shows that without equality in the family, there can be no equality for women in the public sphere. So equality in the family is a critically important for women to be fully um, you know, participating citizens of this country. You've made some really excellent recommendations, Sherry, to improve the rights of women in the family. Is there, can I ask you a question? Is there any hope? You know, we've been working on this for decades, right? Is there any hope that there can be progress on all these fronts, or on the recommendations you have made over the next few years? Or should, really, should we just give up on expecting the government to bring change, resort to other forms of culture? that in the end will make it politically costly for the government to continue to ignore the injustices against women. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Zaina, for a very challenging question. <laughs> um, well, uh, I think first and foremost, uh, we must always remember the women's movement has always been about hope, courage, and tenacity and, and we will go on uh, whatever the challenges, whatever the barriers might be. So indeed, the political situation now is extremely challenging. I would say it's uh, challenging much more than perhaps previously because of the changes and all the um, um, uh, you know, the, the, the challenge to the validity of the governments that are in place that are coming on board. The, general, uh, the Gender Equality Act, for example, we were discussing during the PH government is not a focus uh, anymore. Uh, and child marriage reform, for example, we were also discussing that, uh, has lost traction. And Islamic family law reform has been on the back burner, I think, since the early 2000s. I think, Zaina, you were involved with it yourself. So the rising Islamic conservative sentiments, um, and, and this is a global force, uh, has become a very toxic element. Um, but, you know, looking on the positive side, I think change is most effective uh, from the ground. So our focus should be as much on changing mindsets on the ground, changing stereotypes and the understanding of Islam and women. And here I do believe uh, there has been some progress um, you know, if we look at domestic violence in the 80s, it was supposedly against Islam. I think the thinking is uh, not completely changed, but it is changing. Um, here itself, we've heard women question their rights, you know, on divorce, on maintenance, on what I deserve uh, and what are, are, are my rights uh, under the law. And online, uh, women have questioned child marriage, uh, female genital mutilation, even their right whether uh, they want to wear a tudong or not wear a tudong, you know, it's a question of choice and, uh, um, you know, what they want uh, for their own uh, bodily autonomy. So there is a growing group of women whose idea of womanhood is changing uh, out there. 
So, you know, I mean, having government respond to the needs and the protection of women, oh, of course, that would be a great option. But, you know, failing that, and I think the situation is such that we need to move on 